Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jan Bass. I am the Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs in the Darlamore School of Business and a professor of economics, so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, just a little side note, I spent a year at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta uh, during the 1991 tech recession, which was very mild, it was an eight-month recession. In any case, I am delighted to welcome you to the 42nd Annual Economic Outlook Conference. We have 249 attendees this year. There's 175 here in the house and 74 participating online. I know that we all look forward to listening and learning from our esteemed speakers about our state and national economy and where they are headed, especially given policy uncertainty, persistent inflation rates that are well above the Fed's 2% target, employment rates uh, as at lows not seen since the 1960s. I was looking at that this morning. And economic growth that I would say is wobbly. So before turning things over to Doug, I want to give a very special thanks to our uh, event sponsors. Uh, that's Dominion Energy, Cushman and Wakefield, South Carolina Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Truist. We truly appreciate your support of this year's Economic Outlook Conference. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Doug. Thank you, Jan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 42nd Economic Outlook Conference here at the University of South Carolina. I've been here for 35 of them, believe it or not. Now, only uh, a few of you can uh, claim you've been here longer, uh, but um, it's good to see you here today. I'm going to be introducing the speakers. Uh, and uh, we have a very exciting program for you here today with a lot of very different kinds of perspectives on the outlook for the economy going into 2023. We have the mayor, Mayor Rickenman, who will be speaking next, uh, Barbara Melton from the port, Felicia Howard uh, from Dominion Energy, our main utility here, she's director of economic development, will also be speaking on the program today. But let me begin by introducing the mayor, Dan Rickenman. A lot of things I could say about the mayor, a lot of interesting things, but one thing that stands out to me is just fascinates that you're a son of Swiss immigrants. Not too many people can say that. Uh, Dan is an alum of USC, so welcome to the Alum Center here. He graduated, you won't believe this, 1992, 30 years ago. Can you, can you believe that? In political science, you share that in common with Darla Moore, both graduates of our political science program here at USC. For those of you like me who have been around Columbia a long time, uh, you've known about the mayor before he was mayor. Uh, he was a restaurateur, entrepreneur, um, most famously uh, for, at least from my perspective, was Birds on the Wire, which was right down the street from me, two locations, both I could walk to. So uh, really always used to enjoy going to Birds on a Wire. But as a result of the mayor's experience as a businessman and as an entrepreneur, he really understands local business and economic challenges and opportunities like taxes and regulations, some of the issues we'll be talking about today. Well, going into 2023, Mayor, it's going to be a challenging year, but an exciting time for South Carolina and for Columbia. Dr. Joey Von Nessen will give us the outlook after your remarks for the state and for the region. Uh, but one thing we're going to hear about today is Columbia has recovered. It has now recovered all the jobs that we lost uh, before the pandemic. We're back to 2019 employment levels here in South Carolina and here in the Midlands. Some, some of our metro regions doing even better than others. In fact, that's one of the challenges for Columbia. We've tended to lag behind other metro areas in the state like Charleston, Greenville, and um, the Charlotte metropolitan area. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes we forget this. One thing that happened before you were mayor, but we're still reeling from, is the uh, loss of a major headquarters. Not too many regions could 
uh, withstand that without a significant effect on the economy. Of course, I'm talking about Scana, which now moved up uh, to Richmond. So we lost a lot of talent, major headquarters here in the region, a lot of jobs, uh, and then it was, of course, the whole fallout from the bankruptcy and, and the financial meltdown of uh, the nuclear facility. If we had had that investment coming online right now with energy, nuclear, we'd be in a really good shape right now, but it didn't happen. So that's one challenge we've had here in the Midlands. Also, private sector expansion has been lagging behind other regions, uh, but also not well known, and this is the backbone of our economy, is state and local government employment is down. We used to think that was always recession proof and if anything would grow, but it's below where we were in 2008, over 10 years ago. So, you know, we don't have the benefit of that as a big job generator anymore. But looking forward, we have huge potential in this city and region, and we have a mayor who's deeply engaged in economic development. So to lead off the conference today and talk about the prospects for Columbia in 2023, please join me in welcoming Mayor Rickenman. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, y'all can say good afternoon, it's okay. Um, really excited to be here. You know, it, this is real easy. Columbia is on a great trajectory. Everything's great, so I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, no, seriously, folks, this has been a very exciting time. I, I, I have just completed the, the first 12 months of being mayor in Columbia, and I have to tell you, we're in an exciting place and things are going forward. But, you know, we're also looking at is how do we embrace the uncertainty of the economic uh, outlook as we look at the world and how restructuring and a huge influx of people moving around and figuring out where where am I going to move? Where's where's my new business going? Where am I going to put my tent as I'm deciding to about quality of life, jobs and everything else? But I find us in a very unique Columbia. Let's talk about Columbia home of 60,000 students, one of our greatest assets across nine total campuses here. Um, we haven't embraced those students. They are our future, they're our workforce, and they're part of our outlook for the future on how are we keeping those students here. We look across and we see that how our students impact every aspect of our life, from our retail to our hospitality, to our future job growth, to our innovation, and our participation in growing. I tell people a lot of times, I'll take these 60,000 students over the ocean seven days a week, 365 days a year, because their impact is that great in our community. Obviously in, in Columbia, South Carolina, we have another great asset, it's called Fort Jackson. Um, a lot of people forget that Fort Jackson, McIntyre, uh, military base, uh, Air Force base, and others, support over 57,000 jobs in our community, a net impact of $6.6 .6 billion. The Midlands is home to over 18,000 service workers, over 79,000 veterans, 16,000 retirees, employ, employs an additional 3,400 Department of Defense civilians that stay here year round. And then you just look around at, at our assets at the city limit regionally. We have come together regionally to understand that here we are in a population of roughly 760,000 people with about 400,000 people ready to work. We have a workforce that no other region in South Carolina has. We are destined for the next major announcement in South Carolina. It is going to be here in the Midlands because we have the resources, we have the quality of life, and we've set ourselves up to have the only place with the true workforce for the future. Now, most cities have been impacted severely by recessions, and you heard Doug mention recession-proof, and we have been fairly recession-proof. What we weren't proof was pandemic-proof. And what it showed us is how important it is for us to continue to invest in our community and to sell the assets of Columbia to attract businesses here and to improve and make sure that we're helping our small businesses grow here in South Carolina. 
We've had in the Columbia region, we've grown about 2.3% over the last decade. We've been lagging behind for, for many reasons. You heard um, Doug mention, you know, we have 470 jobs open at the city of Columbia right now. I, I forgot what the state number was off the top of my head. But thousands of jobs in government employment that are open, but we also had a, a tax situation. Modernizing our tax structure here in Columbia is gonna be one of our main keys as we continue to move forward so that we can be competitive. Charleston is 48% less than, than Richland County. Greenville is 38%. Rock Hill's roughly 21, 22. So we're average about 31 and a half percent more expensive than our sister cities. So we not only do we have to, to modernize our tax structure to make it more competitive for us here in our community um, to attract folks uh, at the same time without affecting our home ownership and, and other taxing entities on how we do that. But the bright side is, is there's been a lot of, lot of changes moving forward. You know, we, we picked a slogan, we are open. We're open for business, we're open for innovation, we're open for ideas, and we're open for anyone and everyone to come to the table so that we can grow because our push in Columbia is to be the number one city in South Carolina. As we continue to meet with investors, we're sharing all our assets. We're making sure that we're telling our story and we're being part of it. We're bringing people together. Collaboration was the number one negative that came out in surveys about our community. And think about that for a minute. Collaboration. The simple thing that helps us get things done has been as our biggest negative. So how are we changing that? Well, regionally, we're meeting as mayors. We're coming to the table and meeting quarterly to talk about how we can work together and support each other. Because people now understand it doesn't matter if a major employer goes to Kershaw, Blythewood, Casey, Lexington, Calhoun we're all gonna benefit from it and we should support each other. We had the first application ever to the federal government for a major grant in the re realignment of the railroad downtown that included our entire congressional delegation. I'm talking the entire state. You had Congressman Clyburn and Senator Graham calling the transportation secretary on our behalf together. You had Richland County, Lexington County delegation all coming together. Every mayor in the region signing on that application and letters of support, including the university and our major employers here, because that's the kind of application we need to present. And that's how we need to continue to work as a community moving forward to really have growth is to collaborate and realize that we're not in silos. We're only going to grow together. Our major flagship university being part of that conversation. Engaging each of the nine campuses here along with that are so important for our future growth. You know, as we continue to talk about Columbia making the changes, making it easier to do bit modernizing. We've got design guidelines that have been in place for 25 years. We have one mile in diameter in our downtown empty parking lots. One mile in diameter, think about that. That could all be buildings where we could have people living, breathing, retail, restaurant, growing our econ economy, embracing what we have. So think about this for a minute. Columbia, South Carolina gets 15 million visitors a year. 15 million. Myrtle Beach gets 22. Only 5 million of those spend the night. So how do we change that? By creating more opportunities for people to stay and engage. Creating more opportunities for people to live downtown. We have 3,400 3, people living in downtown Columbia compared to Greenville and Charleston that are between nine and, and 11,000 people living downtown. Our goal is to increase that downtown living. Having more young professionals stay here and realize there's a choice. We created an intercollegiate council of engagement with all those nine institutions, grad students, undergrad students, trying to cross-pollinate our campuses, but also get them engaged in our community. Why are they leaving? 
Well, one of the biggest things we heard was there's no downtown living. Today's population, especially millennials, want a place that they can live, work, eat, get services, all with walking. They're not interested in buying a house in Rosewood and commuting to downtown. They're interested in being able to be connected through greenways and walkways and pathways, being part of a community that they can walk to and engage without ever having to get in their car. And if you look at the growth patterns across the southeast, Atlanta, Beltline, number one growth area, Howell Mill Road, uh, you pick, pick a neighborhood in, in Nashville, Edgewood, 12th Street, West End, all places where people can live, eat, work, and, and get everything that they need in one place. Charlotte, South, South Boulevard. There's a reason why Lowe's has moved their back office into a tower downtown in the South, South Boulevard neighborhood because that's where their future employment is. That's where the people who want to work for them want to live. So we're having to adapt and learn how we're dealing with that. But all the simple things that allow us to help small businesses grow in this community, like eliminating sewer expansion fees that were calling, causing small businesses thirty and forty thousand dollars before they even had had gotten their permit to change an empty space from retail into restaurant or other use, taking away parking minimums and letting the business decide what that means allowing development to happen and grow in pockets that have stayed stale. North Main, between Elmwood and probably the split Monticello and North Main is, is, is our, our future growth. That is Howe Mill Road in Atlanta, right here. These, we have three historic neighborhoods tied to in there on one end and six more on the other end all disconnected by four lanes of road. Narrowing that road, get, taking away those parking minimums, lifting the design guidelines that have been in place for close to 12 years. But we have one new building on that stretch of North Main. We've gotten in our own way. So now sitting down and making those changes, dealing with how we move forward as a community is really about working together and, and co coming together and understanding that there are cave people. And if you don't know what a cave person is, that's a citizen against virtually everything. Um, and we have about 25 of those, to be honest. Those are the folks who show up to a lot of meetings and they carry a lot of weight. But what you understand is, is that there are 139,422 other people in this community that we have to work for and we have to help grow. So we're continuing to work to improve our community by bringing people to the table, but also not letting a small group stop growth. Everything that we're doing is built, built around us working together. This, this it's not about me as an individual, and it's not about an individual. It's about we as a community coming together. But what drives me personally are four things that my mother taught me as she dropped me off. Some of you may or may not know, severe learning disability. I had to go away to school to learn how, that's how I ended up at the University of South Carolina because it had a disabled student services. Uh, a lot of colleges didn't have that, that it, when I was uh, coming through. But there were four things, which was you gotta work hard every day. Every challenge, every hurdle is just pure opportunity. And if you look at it that way, you'll get through it. Number three is, you know, trying something and failing is okay because people don't judge people on failure. They judge it on how they recover. So as long as you learn and you improve, there's no reason why you shouldn't take the risk. And then last is to give back. And I'm in the give back stage. But we keep moving forward at the city, continuing to invest in our, our employees in, with technology training and, and allowing them to actually do their job. And what we're learning is some of our ordinances and some of the things that we're trying to change have actually prohibited them from doing their job, which then slows down progress, which then keeps people from getting permits in a, a timely manner and having to be put through all of these long committee meetings just to be heard about getting a zoning change or a design guideline change and changing the way we look at things to make it easier for people to make investments in our community. 
<laughs> trying every day. Um, as we continue to look at how we recruit in the future, we're revamping our um, economic development office. We're revamping our office, office of business opportunity. We are going on a tour. We are going to recruit. We are going to sell. We are going to have people that are actively today doing what other communities are doing, which is recruiting development teams. You don't recruit businesses today. You're recruiting development teams because that's who has the relationship. Bringing those folks here and sharing with them what Columbia has to offer. When I tell people about Columbia, South Carolina, the first thing they say to me is, why don't y'all tell anybody about this community? And I think it's because we've had so many mixed messages and sometimes, you know, look, having being two hours from the mountain and two hours from the beach is an asset. It is not our opening line. So we have to change that narrative. We need to talk about our quality of life, our business opportunities. You know, there's a business here getting ready to hire 225 people locally. 225 people. They're worth a billion and a half dollars and they've been located over in the IBM building here in Columbia since, well, they haven't been in that building, but they've been in Columbia since 1972. And I bet 90% of the people in this room don't even know who they are. We have to start celebrating our businesses if they're big or small. I've had the great opportunity in the last 12 months to do 57 ribbon cuttings. People are like, why do you do all those ribbon cuttings? Because I want to support those businesses because they made an investment. The majority of those businesses have been women-owned and minority-owned businesses. That says something about our community. We've had over 1,200 new business license applications in the last 12 months. That's home-based businesses. That's new, new businesses. That tells you that people are interested in quality of life is important. But for us to be competitive at the level, investing in, in technology incubators, chasing the cyber world, $89 billion is what it's worth to, to South Carolina. Um, Georgia, just, Georgia State Legislature just invested $100 million into building a collaborative lab based around cybersecurity. We have to be competitive. North Carolina is chasing us with corporate tax lowering, making it easier for them. There's a reason why Apple chose North Carolina. And a big part of that is Durham. Duke and Durham have come together to realize that working together improves the entire community. They're the best example out there that I've seen. 100,000 square feet of collaborative space, over 1,000 startup businesses that have access to capital, microloans, mentors, collaborative lab space. We have an opportunity to do that here downtown by working with these different companies and showing people that we're an entrepreneurial community by collaborating, making introductions, and for government, getting the hell out of the way. Um, because what we do best is when we do the least. But why Durham is so important is those 4,000 jobs that Apple are getting is average $178,000. And folks, that's what I want for Columbia, South Carolina. 4,000 jobs at an average of $178,000 would be what we want for our future. And this is not just about, about us today, it's about our kids. You know, I hope at some point my daughters come back to Columbia, but they don't have to sacrifice their job and their careers to do it. They ought to have every opportunity that they have anywhere else right here in Richland County or Lexington County or Kershaw County, Calhoun County, Fairfield County, the Midlands is strong, and I believe that. We're continuing to invest to make sure that we're taking opportunities of every federal funding, every state funding that's out there. We've hired third-party um, professionals to help us go after that, because a lot of people don't realize the majority of the money that's available to our communities that we may not ever see again in a lifetime is all application-based and it's competitive, and we're geared up to go after every bit of it so that we can be the number one city in Columbia. Working together, great opportunity to sit down and meet with a business who wants to make a billion dollar investment in our community, 1,800 $1, jobs. Working with the county, constantly working together. What we're doing is trying to change the face of economic development and be a united community. 
because we know collaboratively that is the only way that we are going to get the investments and, and get the jobs that our community deserves. And I believe working together and, and doing this in a strategic fashion that shares all of our stories, all of our communities, will allow us to, to, to overcome anything that's coming in the future. With that, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna take some questions, but there are mics out here for anybody who wants to ask a question. Got some folks down here. Um, hello, I'm Jaden Valdez. Uh, I am an undergraduate student at the Darwin Moore School. Um, I was just wondering, what are you doing to reach out to students like myself, right? So I'm not from Columbia, I'm from uh, Charlotte area. Uh, and I definitely, you know, have my own opinions about like, I'd rather live in obviously Durham where there's tech jobs and stuff. Um, so what are you doing to reach out to us and to ask us like, what we want um, and to, to get that, that roadmap and to include us in the, in the future, as you, as you said. So uh, the couple things we're doing right now is we created this intercollegiate in council of engagement. We have members that filed to, to be part of that, and we have representatives from all nine institutions. For the university, because it's our largest flagship, we have post-grad, undergrad, and graduate students that are involved in that process, and they're helping us with the pulse. We're also holding in February a town hall at the university to continue to listen. So to understand how this happened, and I think it's very important, is, is in May of 2021, some post-grad students tweeted out, the reason students aren't staying in Columbia, South Carolina is because y'all don't like us. You treat us badly. And, and I was like, oh, well, I'm curious, what does that actually mean? So I tracked down the tweeter. Um, I think that's a term. Um, but I ended up being in a room with 34 people. Law students, graduate students, undergrads, engineering students, all who wanted Columbia to be their home and they were tired of their friends leaving. And it was very interesting because they said, think about this, for the last two and a half years, Every day, either on WIS, not picking on the station, WAIS, I know y'all are here, um, or the state paper, and I am picking on the state paper today for that, because there was a headline about students. If it was pandemic or it was bars or you, you name it, everything was, oh, they're destroying our neighborhoods, they're doing this. When you looked at the reality of it, it was a very small portion of that. But the kids started going, do you know how much economic impact each of one of us brings to this community? Do you understand that you, we're your future workforce, that you don't have a workforce without us, that we're 60,000 strong? And you start to add up all the numbers and you understand the value of that and how much we spend. And that's how it started. And so what I started to figure out is we have to engage the students. We created this council to make sure we had all the, the campuses involved to understand. The first thing I learned was students want to, if they want to work here, they want to live downtown. They want the same amenities. They want nice amenities. They also want to know that there's jobs with opportunities that the future, what does that hold for us? And what, how does that look if I stay here and I work and I get married? What does it look like? What are my options? And how, how do we embrace more of Columbia? Because one of the things we found out engaging with the students is a lot of them didn't know the things that were going on in Columbia. So the three things we've challenged our, our council with is, one, how do we engage the campuses and the city together more? How do we involve students in what's going on? How do we share more information? How does a student at Benedict know that, that, that they can go to the homecoming concert at the University of South Carolina? So we're gonna create an app, not only that shares all the information, but restaurants and hey, there's, a, there's this small business here that's hiring, just a, a highway of information that people can click on, which hopefully will be something we can use as a community. The second thing is we said we're gonna pick an economic development challenge. Well, we've decided that we're going after Apple to get an Apple store because we want an Apple store in Columbia, South Carolina. 
And so we're using every campus to create a social media campaign to do that. We're starting that in January. And then the, the third piece was, was how do we continue to get students involved from a freshman experience? So if you have the app, but how do we work with the universities to create more freshman experiences if it's floating down the river? You got folks that, in the Darla Moore that maybe one class is doing it, but not the rest of the university. How do we share what we have at the zoo, the Congaree Swamp? You know, the fact that the McKissick Museum right here at the university's campus is probably one of the finest art museums there is in the southeast and nobody knows about it. How do we make sure that you know about all the businesses that are, that are in town that you can support from a small level? How do you know about the incubator that the Boyd Foundation just funded down in Five Points as one of the beginning steps and the six different tech companies and cybersecurity companies that are coming here to help us develop an opportunity for you to be engaged in that? So that, that, that's part of our goal. But part of it's going to be us getting into the campuses. We've never done that, to be honest with you. And town hall is the first step. We tried to do it this fall, but Dr. Amaritas' schedule and all the things going on, we couldn't do it. But we're going to do it this February. We have an opportunity where we're going to be sitting there answering questions and engaging and listening to you, the students, on how you can be part of our future. Um, well, thank you. I definitely felt heard. Um, a lot of those solutions are really on the point. I think the third one specifically, um, getting out and you know, advertising all the opportunities. Uh, I know a lot of students uh, in my own circle who, you know, don't know about that, uh, you know, getting an Apple Store here and the, uh, the tech uh, opportunities out in the Vista. So um, thank you, and I'm excited to, to see uh, what you do in the future. And I, and I will tell you, we took the whole group, we took a group of the students from our council to meet with the Midlands Business Leadership Group here um, so that they could see that, you know, these young folks want to be engaged, but they didn't know about their capture program or didn't know about internships and how we got to communicate better and communicate the way you communicate. You know, we are on Facebook, you're on TikTok right. and, and Instagram. Yes. How do we use those, those communication levels, but also engaging and knowing that you ought to be able to pick up the phone and call my office and say, hey, I had an idea. We want to hear from you. Um, well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Ma'am, you had a question down here. Hi, thanks for being here. I'm Susan Cotter, and I am a resident of the city of Columbia, so have a vested interest in what you're doing, uh, particularly the tax structure. So <laughs> looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, professionally, I advise businesses, and I'm curious, what are the top points that you share to compel businesses to locate or relocate to Columbia? You know, it's, it's very interesting is, is that part of what we, we've been using is the facts that I've said probably three or four times a day is these 60,000 students, the military base. When people look at our population, they're only looking at our, our full-time residents. They're not looking at the population of our student population. They're not looking at all the military. You know, we get 45,000 recruits to come through here. What's interesting about that is we also get 250,000 parents and family members that come to see those recruits. Dang, the average stay of a military family during graduation week is three and a half days. It's three and a half days they're making an economic impact in our community. That's why I go to graduation. That's why I have a, a working relationship as we do as a community with Fort Jackson. We're constantly selling, we're, but we also talk a lot about how important it is as we're restructuring the taxes. We share with people the changes that we've made from a business standpoint, you know, parking minimums, things. But the tax modernization is, is probably the, the one elephant in the room that con constantly comes up. And our goal is to create over a 10-year period to levelize our property tax so that it would go from 4% from 6% on the commercial and renters. And people have to understand that non-owner occupied is everything from rental to commercial. So right now we have a structure where if you're a $30 million investor or a major corporation, you're gonna get a 50% abatement over a 10 year period and you know, all's great for you. But the guy who's hiring 10 people and bought a half a million dollar business is paying a 6% assessment, which is probably costing them 
I'm guessing around $18,000 a year in property tax. Think about if we could levelize that by 31% reduction over a, a 10 year period so that it levelizes without affecting the homeowner because we can't change Act 388. The state has put itself in a bad box. But we in the, locally in the community have not really been watching as our tax structure grows. And if you look at all the different entities and, and how it's played, so the only way for us to do it is to slowly do it over a period of 10 years. So the first two years, we would take all, all the funding that we get over our, our growth pattern. So 2.3% 2, 2 growth has been our now, so that's our stabilization. We've, we've learned to live with that, so that's our stabilization. Those first two years, we cap it out. We put that money in a reserve account. And then the next eight years, we drop it by a percentage point down. It's a quarter percent and a third and how it goes till we get to a point where we're levelizing that we're at almost 4% equal with what the homeowner. Think about what that does for investment, for small businesses, home ownership. You can't talk about affordable housing if you're not going to talk about the tax structure. You know, I know I've heard, you know, there's arguments out there. Folks say, well, hey, you know, that's just going to benefit the landlord. Well, absolutely it's going to benefit the landlord, but it also creates competition. And right now we don't have competition because those folks aren't investing in it because they're having to spend three and a half months of their collection to pay the property tax bill. So those are the key points. And I'll tell you the other thing that we're doing is we're using the mayor's office in this community to, 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 to tell people how much we want them. The physicians, so one of the hardest things that we're recruiting in Columbia right now. I'm personally sending letters with recruiters to each one of those folks. We're calling businesses on behalf of folks, uh, real estate developers and other folks who have asked, personally engaging with those businesses and showing them how we can help them. And I'm guaranteeing them a building permit in X amount of time. If I personally have to walk it through, I will do that. This is about changing what the perception of Columbia that we're a hard place to do business. We're a great place to live, but a hard place to do business. And it's just it's one step at a time. Harry. Uh, I'm going to ask an unpopular question. I'm known for doing that. Um, you talk a lot about attracting new folks, about attracting students to stay and live here. One of the things that we struggle with in Columbia and the surrounding areas is when we bring new businesses in, those businesses are targeting the new folks and the students where Columbia, a lot of your voters, obviously have lived here for decades and are still at the bottom. How do you, what, what is the city doing to address the pockets around the city that are really struggling and will not be part of the tech future of Columbia? So, great question, number one. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed is, is that we haven't gone after federal opportunities really to invest, especially in some of our underserved communities. And so one of the things that is part of bringing in these third party consultants, we're going after, and this is just one example, going after a choice neighborhood grant. It's worth about $35 million. I went to Wall Street, sat down with some third party investors, some institutional lenders and said, hey, if, you know, for one, I went there so I could hear their outlook about the future, all right? There's restructuring going on. How should we be prepared? And you know, that's where you hear about collaborative efforts. You hear about tax structure, making it easier, the quality of life, and selling the quality of life. But we're going after this Choice Neighborhood Grant because that'll allow us to leverage well over $100 million that we can invest. This summer, we tore down 68 houses in some of our challenged neighborhoods. Uh, that were dilapidated and tearing, and we're, we've just put an RFP out for all the city's residential lots. We've owned some lots for close to two decades. And we partnered up with a mortgage company and some builders, and we're putting home ownership out there. Uh, the first 19 lots went out on RFP two weeks ago. We're getting respondents now. We've got, I think, six or seven respondent teams. We'll build 19 homes uh, there to start. Um, we've applied for multiple grants for 
community art and green space so that we can go into some of these, these targeted areas, create not only a public art that adds pride to it, but also some green space to encourage more growth. We've lost, we've lost 9% of our population and a lot of it is in these older neighborhoods. So get reconstituting, getting people back in those neighborhoods, lighting, you know, sidewalks, investing in it in the community stores. And part of the overall plan is, is 2004, there was a plan called the East Central Plan. Uh, 29203, 29204, and parts of 29205, very challenged areas where it talked about how we increase housing options, how we get small business growth, building little pocket nodes, more neighborhood oriented stores away from big box so that they have the opportunity to hire locally but also survive on a smaller scale of sales because density takes time to build. And everybody thinks we can just drop a grocery store somewhere and it works. It's, it's, it's a density story. But as we, we took that plan out and we revamped that plan and that's what we're using for this choice neighborhood, that's just, that, that, that's one example. Um, this summer we did um, a program with some kids who were under the age of 14 who couldn't go get a job and we paid them to clean up their neighborhood. We paid them to clean up their neighborhood and be part of it and invested. And part of it was is if we could get a program that helped give kids an opportunity to, to, to make money, but also learn how that they could save that and they could use that to buy their own things, but also put the sense of pride because then what we started to notice is, is that then people started cleaning up their yard. And then there was a sense of, hey, we need some more things to go in our neighborhood. So we brought back a, a community gr uh, promotions fund where communities could go and get small grants for beautification. So they could do some things where they're invested in their own community. Um, we created Love, Love Thy Block, which is another program where neighborhoods could go in and take part of that. And it's building up that sense of pride but also putting a lot of pressure on bad landlords. You know, uh, we gotta have clean, safe, affordable housing to be a strong community. And we have to have a diverse community in our city to be strong. Um, Greenville just came off doing a great study called Imagine Greenville. It's about what their future housing needs are. Uh, we're getting ready to go through the same process, but what was very interesting is 85% of their housing needs are duplexes, townhomes, and quadruplexes. And what was interesting is the three major character um, groups of folks who were looking for that. One is millennials that are, are looking, don't want to have a yard. Families who are downsizing. Single mothers with no kids at home. Major component of future housing needs, but we're not set up for it right now. We've got to go back and change our zoning because we pushed for so long single family homes that we've forgotten that not everybody wants that today. Other people want opportunities to, to lock the door and leave or have the opportunity that they can rent three of the units to pay for their unit because that's their, their, their retirement income. We have to be more creative and, and open-minded um, but we're making those investments. If it's in healthcare, working with our, I mean, think about it. We got Lexington, Prisma, and MUSC now here. We got a public school of health and a medical university getting ready to embark on a big investment that really between, and rumor is that we possibly even can get uh, a head trauma unit here, uh, orthopedic growth. Uh, kind of research center. Think about what that does f for, for the impact of our community. So a lot of irons in the fire. I will tell you from an economic development standpoint, the other thing we're doing is trying to embrace the university um, and our surrounding universities and colleges to talk to their alumni. We got a lot of alumni who are in some, some major positions in international companies and we need to be recruiting them to, to put a subsidiary here or cyber unit or making an investment in our community. And I think we're gonna try to be creative as we can on recruitment and using those emotional ties to Columbia, our university and colleges as part of that st strategy. Yes, sir. Just curious, uh, 
where the state of our infrastructure is, especially as we look to this, and I certainly want to say we are very grateful and thankful you are our mayor, Mr. Mayor, but uh, just curious how that uh, state of the infrastructure is at this point. Thank you. So as you know, we're investing, and in infrastructure for me is more than just the water and sewer, which we're investing average about $80 million a year into our system to improving it you know, um, left and right. Obviously, we're working on uh, infrastructure grants. Uh, Chris, uh, there, I think there's 10 grants we're applying for now that, so that we can leverage, so we can move projects along. But infrastructure is also for us is investing internally in new equipment, technology, training. Um, you know, today investing in more things like shot spotter to help our police department. Look, this it's the hardest recruiting thing we have out there right now is, is hiring officers, Richland County, Lexington County, ourselves across the country. So we have to supplement a lot of that with new innovative ways, technology and others. So it's for infrastructure for me is continuing to invest. We made a pledge in this year's, this past year's budget and moving forward to invest in the city first, fixing Finley Park, improving our parks, developing the riverfront, making sure that we're addressing stormwater issues as we've done, you know, we passed a $90 million bond that we're focused on dealing with that as we, as, as we continue to change and grow in populations, we're gonna have some of these challenges, but investing in it ahead of time. How are we taking care of all of those different pieces together and working with our partners? Uh, sitting down with DOT, you know, we have 492 miles of road in Columbia, South Carolina, 71% of it's controlled by DOT. So partnering with DOT and Richland County to come up with programs that we can keep our streets clean and safe because right now, the majority of all the maintenance money goes to our highways. It doesn't go to our secondary roads. So working with the legislator and trying creative programs, investing ourselves together, you know, as we plan moving forward, as we go to, to redo roads and, and add roads, making sure that we're not creating more work and collaborating together and leveraging those dollars, applying for grants together from the feds, asking the state to more invest. All of these things are all about collaborative efforts. It's the only way that we're gonna succeed and continue to grow, but every day we're investing in our community and focused on making sure, you know, the canal comes up a lot. I'm surprised somebody didn't ask it. You know, that has been a process for five, almost seven years to go through the process at the federal level so that we can rebuild our canal. Uh, but it, it also, in this delay, brought the good light is that they also, FEMA granted us $45 million to create an alter, alternative water source so that we can have in case something happens in the future. Because let's face it, our canal is one of two canals in the state. It's well over 100 years old. Uh, Union only is the other community has the exact same setup that we do. But they're also allowing us and, and providing us funding to redo our hydro plant. That's 10 megawatts worth of power that we're going to use to offset our water treatment facility, which then allows us with that savings to reinvest back into our community. So taking those opportunities there and leveraging to make sure that we're getting a multiple return on our investments. Anybody else? I think I'm getting the hook here. I feel like we could go all afternoon asking questions of the mayor, but thank you very much. I feel so much better about Columbia now um, and uh, really appreciate all the efforts that the mayor has, has made over the just short time that you've been mayor to improve our city. Next up is Joey Von Nessen, our leading expert on the South Carolina economy, who's under 60. I should say. Um, no, he's a leading expert. Joey is, is a Furman grad, uh, has a PhD in economics from USC back in 2009, and like the mayor, uh, after he graduated, start, decided to stay here in Columbia. Today, uh, Dr. Von Nessen is going to talk about the outlook for the South Carolina economy in 2023. Uh, as we've done for 42 years, uh, we are going to talk about the major issues that are facing uh, South Carolina as, as well as the rest of the nation, inflation, recession, jobs, income, housing. So a lot to talk about. Dr. Von Nessen, 
Please join us. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all again for being here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Joey Von Nessen. I'm a research economist here in the Darla Moore School of Business in our division of research where we practice applied economic research, which entails a variety of regional economic impact analysis and includes forecasting as well that we're going to talk about today, evaluating the state of the South Carolina economy, as well as the broader southeastern and, and national economies as well. So over the next few minutes this afternoon, I'm going to talk about where we are in December of 2022, how we got here and where we are headed in 2023. And just to preview these comments, the world, the world is not ending. Uh, there's a lot of fear out there, of course, as, as we all know, a lot of concern about a recession next year. Uh, and we're gonna put that in context, what those concerns look like and how valid they are as we move forward. And really setting the stage this afternoon, I think it's important to think from a 30,000 foot view about where we are in, in 2022, because it's been a very unusual year for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that we've seen some contradictory or seemingly contradictory economic metrics across the board. And this can be perhaps most easily, uh, we can use an example, the, the best example to easily illustrate this is the fact that this past summer, uh, we might all remember that we were having somewhat of a debate or discussion about whether we had been in a recession, right? Because we had two consecutive negative quarters of GDP growth during the first half of this year, first half of 2022. But at the same time, we faced a very strong job market and we've had consistently strong consumer spending. So these economic metrics really pulling us in different directions in terms of evaluating where we are. And I think one reason for this, why we had, have had such uh, uh, divergent uh, measures this year, is because the economy is very much imbalanced in 2022. And in 2023, we are likely head to a realignment or a recalibration of the state's economy. And that's going to be a theme that I come back to several times this afternoon very much imbalanced this year and looking to recalibrate as we move into 2023. And we are imbalanced in the sense that demand is far outpacing supply and has been for the last several years and that has certainly continued into 2022. And one way I like to, to think about this, I, I always like to use a, a, an analogy to illustrate the point. And essentially what we have seen is a $6 trillion stimulus, set of six uh, stimulus packages that totaled around $6 trillion between 2020 and 2021. And that was the equivalent of the US economy drinking a Red Bull. And we've been on a caffeine high over the past two years that has led to this high level of consumer demand. And the side effect of this caffeine high has been high inflation. So this is a very imbalanced economy. And as we move into 2023 and look to recalibrate, one of the questions, perhaps the biggest question, is whether we have to actually go through a recession to recalibrate to more long-term norms as we move back to balance between supply and demand. And then one other way we can also see this, uh, this really divergent set of metrics uh, is to look actually at how consumer sentiment is doing. And one way to do that is actually look at the, the US misery index, which is not an official metric, uh, but it's one that is uh, a helpful way to compare different periods. Um, so the misery index is just a, a sum of the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. So I think we could all agree that as unemployment and inflation go up, that tends to make people more miserable in general. Uh, so an informal metric that correlates pretty strongly with consumer sentiment. And as you can see here, we can track it over time and the horizontal black line illustrates uh, where we are today. And you can just see that uh, consumer confidence and the misery index is at its highest level. The misery index is at its highest level uh, going all the way back to 2008 which is very unusual considering that consumer spending is so strong. And uh, as I'm gonna illustrate in a few moments, uh, consumers are actually in pretty good financial shape right now in, in 2022. But notice also that the reason for the dissatisfaction or the reason for the misery index is very different this year compared to, to, to 2008. Um, so we can actually black out part of this graph to make it a little bit easier to see. Um, and notice that in 2008, the primary contributing factor to the misery index was high unemployment, uh, whereas this year it's, it's high inflation. So we have a very different economic scenario that we find ourselves in in 2022 uh, compared to, to 2008. 
So as we look ahead then uh, and begin to consider how we got in this situation and where we are headed, there are three basic questions that I want to address with you and pr put some perspective on. Uh, the first, the most uh, obvious and most important question, is a recession inevitable? Uh, related to that, when will inflation subside? And then finally, how long will this current labor shortage last? Which is something that I think we're all familiar with. We certainly see help wanted signs in every window in virtually every industry sector, certainly across South Carolina and largely across the U.S. as well. Um, so what, is, what are the next steps and what can we expect for each of these questions? So first, as we start, we have to get a sense of how we got here. Why did the economy speed up? Why did we speed up so much over, over the last two years? And as I mentioned before, part of it had to do with the $6 trillion in stimulus uh, back in 2020 and, and in 2021. And that was a, a, a prime cause. So this manifested itself in the, in the form of stimulus checks that, once again, we're, we're all familiar with, we remember, from 2020 and 2021. It also manifested in enhanced unemployment insurance benefits for, for many South Carolinians, uh, and also other tax credits as well, including child tax credits. And then separately, we saw uh, student loans uh, that, that the, the, the repayments were deferred. So all of this, when you put that together, leads to uh, providing additional financial resources for households, for consumers. And then we can add to that as well a rapidly recovering labor market. Uh, we saw a very fast recovery over the last two years in, in South Carolina, and so people were going back to work, they were earning wages, and you put these two things together, people going back to work quickly and having access to stimulus funds in a variety of different ways, and that generates very high levels of demand and a very imbalanced economy, uh, which again is where we are right now. So we can see this in the data uh, fairly easily. If we start by looking at the labor market recovery, uh, you can see here, the employment recovery in South Carolina uh, in the last two recession periods. So the green line here represents uh, what we've saw since uh, the end of, of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, recession. Uh, the green line there, and the red line reflects the Great Recession from back in, in 2008. So what you'll notice here, among other things, is that the green line represents a classic V-shaped recovery pattern. So we saw a dramatic decline in employment in South Carolina, about 15% of our, of our total employment base, or about 308,000 jobs were lost between February and April of 2020. Uh, we saw a rapid rebound, and today, if we fast forward to, to where we are now, uh, employment has fully recovered in, in South Carolina, on, this, on average, for the state as a whole. Uh, and employment today is about 2.2% higher than it was before the pandemic began in, in February of 2020. And currently, we have more people working in South Carolina than at any point in our, in our history. So the labor market in general uh, is, is very good in, in South Carolina right now. And we can contrast that, again, going back to this, uh, this red line, uh, to, where we, to the recovery process following the, the Great Recession and the financial crisis in 2008, where it took us about six full years uh, to recover all the jobs lost. So a much faster recovery uh, that we've been able to see this time around. And this extends to most industry sectors, as well as to most regions of South Carolina. We've talked a little bit about Columbia. Um, but we can also look at the specific uh, industry breakdown. Um, so this graph here, I'm not going to go through each one, uh, and it's a, a, maybe a bit hard to see, but each of these bars basically represents a major industry sector in South Carolina. And the percentages at the top represent total employment levels today compared to where they were uh, back in uh, uh, back before the pandemic began in February of 2020. And if it says 100%, uh, that's just where the graph is cut off. That means at least 100%. So you can see, again, we're looking at broad trends here, that most industries have seen close to full recovery in terms of employment losses. So this has been a very broad-based recovery for the labor market in South Carolina over the past two years. And in fact, uh, the one lagging industry is actually the third bar from the left, which you may be able to see, which is construction. And if we were to show you this graph earlier in 2022, back in, back in January, construction actually would have fully recovered as well, would actually be at 100%. So what happened? What happened to construction? The answer is interest rates went up. And that has had a significant effect on, on the housing industry in South Carolina. I'm going to come back and, and talk about that more in a moment. But that's part of that recalibration and readjustment process that the housing market is already seeing. But broadly speaking, the labor market continues to do very well. 
And this is true across regions in South Carolina in addition to industries. Uh, we can just get a quick snapshot of where different regions of South Carolina compare in terms of employment levels today compared to where they were before the pandemic began. Um, the areas in green here, the bars in green represent the ones with the highest growth rates. And you can see that's primarily in the upstate region, Greenville and Spartanburg, also Charleston and Myrtle Beach. And the driving factors here are industry based. So why these four areas? Well, because they have high concentrations of both manufacturing and housing, the housing industry. And collectively, over the past two years, these are sectors that have done very well. And they fit within a broader category of durable goods spending and the goods market more generally. And that is a sector that has done extraordinarily well and has been a driver of the recovery over the last two years. The reason being that in 2020 and 2021, as we all know, people were staying home, they were socially distanced, and as a result, we saw a major shift in the pendulum of spending between goods and services. So people were spending fewer, uh, spending less on services, spending more on goods, and durable goods in particular. Uh, they were looking to move, they were looking to renovate a house, they were looking to buy a car or uh, an appliance. But what they weren't doing was going out to eat uh, and they weren't traveling. And so as a result, we saw the formation of a durable goods bubble uh, that manifested itself in a number of sectors, including manufacturing and housing. And that's why, that's largely why these are the regions within South Carolina uh, that had done so well in terms of recovery. Now that's the labor market. And I mentioned there are two factors here that have created this imbalance. Remember, we're getting back to trying to explain how we got here in terms of the supply and demand imbalance. So we have the labor market piece, which is one component. And the other component was that $6 trillion in stimulus that I mentioned. Now, how do we quantify that? Well, one way we can quantify it is actually to look at the stock of excess US house, household savings by quartile, uh, which this graph illustrates here. And this just looks at the actual excess savings compared to where we were in 2020. So just how much better off uh, are these savings when we compare that to just before the pandemic began back in, in early 2020? And you can see what that looks like uh, where we have excess savings for all households across the income distribution. Uh, this looks at all four quartiles. Uh, the, the next graph here looks or focuses more on uh, the first and second quartiles. These are actually even more important to keep our eye on because uh, this is where much of the spending comes from uh, in, in the US economy. So you can see here that these excess savings have gone up they have peaked in 2021, and they've begun to come down in 2022, but they're still very, very elevated compared to where we were back in 2020. So illustrating that consumers on average, households on average, are still in very good shape. And so you put these two elements together, a rapidly recovering labor market and the benefits of the stimulus, and you see very high levels of consumer spending levels of consumer spending that recovered very quickly. Uh, you can see a V-shaped recovery pattern here as well. So this looks at uh, total US consumer spending over time. And you can see how quickly we jump back up to our, our pre-pandemic and our long run trends. So if we were back in 2016 or 2017 right now, and we were trying to predict consumer spending in 2022, I'd say we could probably do a pretty good job uh, just using that, that trend line as a way to, as a way to forecast. So again, very quickly getting back on track with overall consumer spending. Now, I mentioned a durable goods bubble that had emerged as well. So it's, this is not quite uniform, not quite as simple as it, as it appears. Uh, we can actually break this down into goods and services. Uh, and here you can see very clear evidence of the durable goods bubble that emerged in 2020 and 2021, right? So we see that pendulum swinging away from services towards the goods market as people are staying home. And you can see that has the same properties in that it peaked in 2021 and is now beginning to, to come back down. So in a sense, uh, the, the service sector in general has, has the wind at its back. It's seeing a lot of, of benefits this year from consumer spending preferences simply changing, moving back to pre-pandemic norms. And that's actually been one reason why leisure and hospitality has been a ma major driver of growth in South Carolina in 2022. It's benefiting from these patterns as we move back to, back to pre-pandemic norms. So when we put all this together, we can really get this picture of this supply and demand imbalance. And this next graph, I think, really encapsulates it well and is the best visual that you will see on this supply and demand imbalance 
the green line here just represents cumulative growth in consumer spending compared to where we were back in February of 2020, whereas the red line represents employment gains, employment recovery at the national level now uh, for the U.S. as a whole. And you can see very clearly there is a sizable difference. We're about 6.5% or so above where we were before the pandemic began in terms of consumer spending. But employment levels just recently at the U.S. level it got, back to, got back to where they were in February of 2020. So that six percentage point difference is pretty sizable uh, and illustrates very clearly that difference between supply and demand and that significant imbalance that, that we are seeing. Now, two other quick comments on this point, on this imbalance. First of all, you might look at that and say, well, that's true that consumer spending has been going up, but isn't that just because things cost more, right? Inflation, very high in 2022. Uh, and the answer to that is, is no. These are real, what we call real dollars, real consumer spending, meaning that they're inflation adjusted. So this is a reflection of actual uh, goods and services, the, the actual volume being purchased. So this is not a reflection of increased prices. And the second factor here, uh, as we look at this supply and demand imbalance, is the fact that just because consumer spending is going up significantly and is outpacing growth and employment, that doesn't necessarily always lead to an imbalance between supply and demand. Why is that the case? Because of a factor called productivity that we haven't talked about. Over time, part of a growing economy means that we want a given employment base to be able to produce more, right? So that's a good thing if that begins to happen. But we have not seen productivity growth in 2022. That's another reason why this has led to an imbalance between supply and demand, why that has emerged. And you can very clearly see the productivity trends. In fact, uh, productivity growth has been negative in 2022 uh, so far, and it's actually uh, the, last, uh, uh, the last couple of quarters, it's been among its lowest levels, uh, going all the way back to uh, the 1970s, actually. Um, so productivity has, has taken a hit in 2022. We don't know all of the reasons why, uh, I think one reason is, uh, from what we hear from surveys, is that the work from home phenomenon has become a reality. And in some cases, it can create a dampening effect on some, some productivity in, in some cases. Um, again, we don't know exactly uh, what's, what's going on with this change in productivity, and part of it is, is part of this transition and is a short-term phenomenon. But nevertheless, that's another factor uh, that we are gonna be monitoring as we move into the new year. So how do we restore the supply-demand imbalance? Again, this is something we come back to. We're gonna to have to recalibrate as we move forward. Well, restoring balance is the goal of the Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes, and that's certainly one major priority that they have, and that is expressed in the form of getting inflation down. And so one real question is whether or not it's working. Have we seen any meaningful progress so far in terms of, of inflation reduction? And this is very important uh, for for the future because it has very practical consequences for South Carolinians. When inflation is high, it's something that everybody sees all the time. Uh, anytime someone goes to the grocery store or the gas station uh, or orders something online, they see these prices going up and that has a very real effect uh, on consumer confidence, uh, among other things. Um, so this is a very real phenomenon. And we can see this, we can quantify it in, in South Carolina by just comparing inflation uh, to average hourly earnings, which you can see here. And this actually compares inflation to uh, the different industry sectors in South Carolina uh, over the past two years. So if you look at that, by the way, and you see 14% inflation on the, on the blue bar there, don't, don't panic, uh, that's, that represents 24 months or two years worth of data, not, uh, not 12 months. But you can just compare those two bars on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can see that inflation has outpaced wage growth in South Carolina on average uh, by about five percentage points or so over the last two years. It's been about three percentage points over the last 12 months. So very clearly, the average South Carolinian is worse off from a, a purchasing power perspective, uh, both from the perspective of the last two years as well as for the last 12 months. Now, one other interesting factor here when we look at this is that it's not uniformly true. Some industries are doing better than others. And I mentioned before that leisure and hospitality uh, was seeing pretty strong growth in 2022. And you'll notice leisure and hospitality is also the only industry um, with, a, with a green bar here where we see uh, 
wage growth above the, the inflation rate over, over the past two years. And the reason for that is because leisure and hospitality tends to pay lower wages in absolute terms compared to most other industries. And so they've been losing workers and have had more of a, more of a challenge in terms of attracting and retaining them. And so they just had to raise wages faster than, than most other sectors. Um, so that's why they're a bit of a, a, a unique factor there and really the outlier. Another outlier uh, we can also compare, particularly over the last year, is professional, scientific, and technical services, which you can see on the next slide, uh, in terms of how much wage growth uh, has increased just in 2022. Now, this is a major uh, sector of the economy, but basically it's, it's a, a group of professional services that typically require more education. So these are gonna be services like uh, legal firms and like architects and engineers and again, other highly educated professional services. Um, a lot of STEM fields fall in this category as well. So when we talk about the term, the knowledge economy, innovation and, and commercialization and careers uh, that, that apply to both of those, um, this is largely what, what we're talking about. So a lot of wage growth in this space in 2022 as well across South Carolina, uh, mainly because they didn't see as many layoffs. And so the, the labor shortage itself uh, took a while to, to filter through to this particular industry category. So are we seeing these effects in terms of interest rate increases that the Fed is, is uh, being aggressive about this year, are we beginning to see them take hold? Because we clearly see that this is a problem. And there are two factors when we start looking at inflation data to, to assess this. Uh, the first, as you can see here, the effects of interest rate hikes typically are, are a bit lagged. Um, and this is something that the Federal Reserve has been very clear about. Uh, it takes about 12 to 15 months, or as many as, as 12 to 15 months, for interest rate hikes to really work their way through and to have their full effect on the US economy. And that's why, despite the, or one reason why we've seen steady increases in interest rates throughout 2022, and we're still expecting uh, further ramifications for that next year. The Fed is very sensitive to that. And secondly, uh, it's important to acknowledge that what interest rates can and cannot do. We talk about the Federal Reserve raising rates to increase the cost of borrowing money that's going to taper demand and help resolve the supply and demand imbalance. But keep in mind that part of, of the inflation problem resulted from the supply chain constraints that we've been seeing over the past uh, several years. And, and Barbara's gonna talk more about that. And this is not something that the Fed can do anything about. Right? They can impact demand, but they, they can't impact supply. So we have to look at both factors uh, when assessing what the Fed is doing. So with that in mind, if we look at the actual inflation rate, uh, we can look for, uh, for how we've seen changes based on or following these interest rate hikes that we've experienced so far in 2022. So the overall inflation rate, our top line number, 7.7%, as you can see here. Uh, and here we track it back for the last several years, just to put in perspective how high inflation really is compared to what we were used to seeing uh, before the, before the COVID-19 recession in, in 2020. Note also that we have seen some pullback. So current inflation rates still at 40 year highs, by the way. Uh, but 7.7%, very much better than where we peaked at 9.1% back in June. Um, so that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that much of that decline has actually come from energy prices, from, from gas prices. And while that by, an, by itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, it is a bad thing in the sense that it doesn't represent a broader pullback in inflation across most of the economy. So it's more isolated uh, to the energy sector, which is highly volatile, as, as we all know, uh, among other reasons, because of everything going on in, in Russia and Ukraine. So if we focus a little bit more narrowly and look at other items uh, in the economy, we can also look at the core inflation rate. Uh, and this is one of the measures that the Federal Reserve likes to use um, when evaluating inflation. Uh, the Fed talks about wanting to see a meaningful decline in the rate of inflation before they significantly curtail this pace of interest rate hikes. And when they, when they talk about a meaningful reduction in inflation, they're basically talking about this core inflation rate. Uh, core inflation looks at all goods and services in the economy except for food and energy prices. So not that food and energy prices aren't important, of course, but they tend to be highly volatile. And so the Fed is trying to get a sense of what the long run trends of inflation look like. And that's hard to do uh, when you don't filter out sectors that tend to have a lot of high volatility from month to month. 
And so this is where we run into some questions, because I would argue that it would be very difficult to suggest that core inflation has seen any meaningful progress in the last several months, at least based on, on this graph that you see here. So, uh, so two black lines there, uh, you can see the first before the pandemic, so the average, uh, average core inflation rate, and just compare that to where we are now. Again, not a, not a lot of good news here in the sense that we haven't seen a meaningful, uh, meaningful decline. But there is one other caveat, and that comes back to the housing market that I mentioned before, which has begun to see some pullback in 2022 across the US and, and in South Carolina. And that is, when we look at core inflation, a big piece of that turns out to be shelter costs, turns out to be rental rates. And this graph here shows you uh, one major difference the blue line here actually represents the change in rents, according to Zillow, which is a very, uh, a very current and real-time way to track rental prices over, over time. And you can see there's been some major movement in recent months, in, in 2022. But the red line here represents shelter costs as measured by as measured by the consumer price index, what goes into feeding inflation. And that hasn't taken this into account at all, as you can tell. And a lot of, a lot of these inflation data are actually lagged. Uh, these measures of housing costs are one of them. And so what this suggests is that while core inflation has not come down yet, because rental rates are about 40% of the, 40% uh, of what goes into core inflation, what goes into measuring it, you can see that it, that may be a bit misleading just because those data are lagged. So when we look at more real-time metrics like Zillow, perhaps there is some, some good news on that front as well in terms of, of improvement. Now, why has housing come down? Uh, why have we seen a contraction? Well, I mentioned interest rates leading to higher mortgage interest rates, among other things. We can see here that mortgage interest rates uh, in the United States have effectively doubled throughout 2022, and that's had a significant impact, uh, not only on overall, overall sales activity, uh, but also it has also deterred existing homeowners from potentially wanting to purchase as well. So in a sense, this is a uh, really a double whammy for the, for the housing industry because not only does it make housing in general more expensive, but over the last few years, if you're comparing these mortgage interest rates and you're an existing homeowner, if you've been in a house for a while, you've probably refinanced in the last several years because you've been able to take advantage of historically low interest rates. And so that means it's go going to be less likely that you're gonna wanna move now, given that interest rates have basically doubled this year. So the housing industry, to some extent, is competing against itself this year, uh, in addition to facing, uh, facing the, the headwind of increasingly higher costs for potential new homeowners as well. And we can see this when we look at uh, data across the U.S. and in South Carolina in particular. If we look at single-family housing sales uh, in general, you can see this, uh, the manifestation of the durable goods bubble that I, that I showed you before. In this case, just restricting it to what's going on in housing. Um, so significant growth in 2020 and 2021. And you can see this year we've seen a, a pullback to levels of sales that, we're, uh, that we were experiencing back in uh, back in 2019, so before the pandemic began. This is also true in South Carolina. Uh, we see a very similar pattern, uh, and we can actually compare sales as well as uh, house prices here. Uh, on the next slide, uh, orange takes, or the, the orange bars there represent the change in sales uh, activity. Uh, blue represents pricing. Uh, and again, in South Carolina, a pullback uh, this year of about 23% in terms of total sales. Now that looks, that looks bad, uh, because those numbers are so, so significant, double-digit pullback. Uh, but keep in mind this theme that we are recalibrating, we are readjusting. Um, so this is getting back to a healthier rate of growth that is more likely to be sustainable in the long run. Uh, another way to think about this is, is as a correction, right? So the growth that we had seen in housing over the past two years was not sustainable. Um, so in many respects, this is more of a correction back to, to what we had seen before. Now, why aren't prices coming down as well? Uh, we also see here that there is a, perhaps the largest mismatch between uh, pricing and sales that we've seen at any point in the last several years, right? A major pullback in sales activity, uh, but pricing is still relatively stable as a whole. And the reason for that comes down to uh, a lack of inventory. 
uh, low supply. And this has been a challenge that South Carolina has faced for, uh, for a decade. This very much precedes the pandemic uh, and actually goes back to the financial crisis in 2008. We've been facing as a country and as a state a decade long period of underbuilding. And part of that is because many builders went bankrupt in 2008 during the housing crisis, and many others were far more risk averse and reluctant to, to invest afterwards. Um, and so we have seen a decade long period of underbuilding. And so this lack of supply has helped keep prices relatively elevated, despite the fact that demand has retracted and we've seen a reduction in, in overall sales. We can also see this in employment data, uh, coming back to South Carolina, looking at the industry level. And I just want to uh, share with you uh, this, uh, this visual here, just to illustrate uh, how, how, much of, uh, how much construction really stands out as being the only industry in South Carolina in 2022 uh, that's seen a, a negative rate of, of employment growth. So again, readjustment, realignment, recalibration for the South Carolina economy. Interest rate hikes typically affect the housing industry first. And that's exactly what we've seen in South Carolina in, in 2022. Now, I want to briefly mention the supply chain as well. Uh, Barbara Melvin is going to talk more in detail about that. So I just want to share two quick graphs uh, with you just to illustrate that we are seeing some resolution and some movement in the right direction for the supply chain as well. Uh, two measures, the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. This is a, a composite index uh, that references everything from employment uh, across, uh, across the supply chain in different companies to, to cost, to shipping cost, and, and many others. And in this case, uh, given where we are now, a movement down on this metric is, is a good thing. Uh, it means there's less pressure on the supply chain overall, so you can see that we're getting back to levels closer to 2019. And, with a similar story, we can also look at the U.S. Suppliers Delivery Index. Uh, just how difficult is it uh, to, get, uh, to get supplies uh, delivered? Um, so this is a measure uh, released by the Institute for Supply Management. Uh, and again, the, the point here is to look at the trends. And in general, because of where we've been, uh, a movement downwards uh, can be seen as, as positive in this case. And so we're getting closer to 2019 norms. So that's looking backwards. That's where we are in 2022. But we also, of course, want to look ahead. Where are we going in, in 2023? What can we expect uh, as we move into the new year? What do these trends mean? And what does this rebalance look like? And is a recession inevitable? Do we have to go through one to get back to a more uh, balanced economy between supply and demand? Well, first, what do we know about Fed policy as we move forward? Well, as I mentioned before, the Fed has been very clear that they are going to continue to raise rates until we see a meaningful decline in inflation. And practically speaking, what does that mean? It means that we're likely to see the Fed meet one more time this year and raise rates by 50 basis points before the end of the year. That's very likely. That's something they publicly stated. And it also means that we're likely to see continued rate increases in 2023, though not necessarily at the aggressive pace that we've seen this year. In other words, each rate increase uh, might not be as significant as ones in the past have been uh, because the Fed is also waiting on these lagged effects to show up. And so they are very conscious of this and that, these that, that we will begin to see uh, the existing rate hikes have more of an impact, a more, a more broadly felt impact in, in 2023. But nevertheless, we do expect continued rate hikes going forward. So we need to be on the lookout for what that would imply. One thing it could imply is a pullback in consumer spending. And so far, we really haven't seen that. We've seen a pullback in housing sales, but otherwise, if we look at total US consumer spending, you can see here, this is the same graph uh, I illustrated before, but here we're zoomed in a little bit more uh, just on the last couple of years. And again, consumer spending has been very stable overall, so not much evidence of contraction, uh, at least not to this point. We also see a similar trend in retail sales. Uh, perhaps here, if we look at the long run trend or the three month trend, uh, which is illustrated in red, uh, you can see a bit of a pullback, uh, but still, again, very stable and relatively strong growth in, in retail sales. Uh, another way we can see that or to confirm that is we can put in a, a, dollar, a dotted black line here, uh, which represents retail sales activity, the average that we were seeing in terms of growth before the, uh, before the 
2020 COVID recession. So again, we may have seen some pullback, but very much in line with pre-COVID levels of, of spend overall. So not much evidence of a significant movement in, in spending. Now, despite this, we have seen layoffs in the tech sector. Uh, in 2022, and that is a concern as well. So in addition to housing pulling back, uh, we've seen a lot of major companies make announcements in the tech sector. Um, and part of this may be due to a reduction in demand, but part of it is also due to changes in consumer preferences. Recall that we are moving back, again, realigning between purchases of goods and purchases of services, and the pendulum is swinging back towards services and away from goods and the durable goods market. And so part of that means less online purchasing. And the tech sector really scaled up in 2020. Uh, as we saw the percentage, as you see here, the percentage of retail sales coming from e-commerce really shot up, right? As everybody was staying home and were buying things online and tech companies responded to this in a variety of ways. Uh, but really increasing and expanding their resources. And so now as we see consumer preferences change and move back towards services and away from goods, it means that they might see some scale back as well because of changing demand. So that is an important factor to keep in mind when we look at some of the layoff activity that, that we're seeing across the US uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the tech sector. So if we put all this together then, what does this imply? Uh, what, what can we think about for 2023? When will we see uh, a pullback in demand and what would, that likely look, what would that likely look like? Well, I like to frame it as a race. It's basically going to come down in 2023 to a race between inflation and checking account balances, an, an inflation downwards. Because if we think about it, again, right now, why, why is it the case that consumer spending is doing so well it's primarily because consumers are in a good financial position. They still have these excess savings, these excess checking account balances, but that's not going to last forever. This high level of inflation, these price increases are eating into those excess savings, and eventually they're gonna run out. So the question is whether or not those savings run out before inflation comes back down. If they do, if inflation is still elevated, then that means that we're likely to see a, a much bigger pullback in consumer spending and likely to see, or we're much more likely to see a recession in 2023 as a result. And we can actually graph this phenomenon as well. We can graph this race. So I, I could have put cars on here, but, but I didn't do that today. Um, but, but this is the race, the red line and, and the blue line here. Uh, one is looking at inflation, the other looking at S excess savings compared to 2020. Um, so still a, a long way to go on, on both ends here. Uh, right now it might appear uh, where we see the, the winner uh, is not necessarily the winner we would, we would want to see, or the one in the lead right now. Uh, but again, this is, this is a, a race that we need to be following, and these metrics are gonna be very important and should give us some insight as to whether we see a soft landing uh, in 2023 or, or not. If we do see a recession, uh, what is that likely to look, look like? I wanna conclude uh, my comments by talking a little bit about the job market and what a recession could potentially mean and how we can think about that in South Carolina. Uh, because if we do see a recession and an uptick in, in unemployment and a pullback in the job market, uh, it's, it's gonna be a very unusual situation that we end up observing. And uh, I'm, I like to use the term a jobful recession. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this before. Um, a, a few people perhaps. Uh, but it's, uh, as, as you see here, it's the opposite of a jobless recovery. Uh, which is a pro probably a term that you're more familiar with. It's something that was used a lot in the economic expansion of the early 2000s. Uh, many of you may recall that we saw economic growth uh, in the years leading up to the 2008 Great Recession, uh, but there was a lot of criticism that there weren't as many jobs being created as perhaps there, there should have been, or maybe as many as we would have liked to have seen. Um, so some dubbed it the jobless recovery. And so I think uh, the inverse of that, a jobful recession, uh, may be what we end up seeing in, in 2023 because the labor market has been doing so well that we could see a mild recession and still have a relatively strong uh, employment picture in South Carolina. And we can see this very clearly if we look at the data. So if we look at unemployment rates and just compare them over time, uh, it's really striking how well the labor market is doing now in 2022. If you go back all the way to 1976 and you look at just non-recession periods in South Carolina and just average the unemployment rate, the average unemployment rate turns out to be 5.8%. That's during non-recession periods, 5.8% in South Carolina. 
So just compare that to where we are now, 3.3%. So that's a major, major difference. In addition to that, economists typically talk about full employment at a 5% unemployment rate. Full employment meaning that uh, anybody who wants a job can find a job, or at the very least, if they can't find a job, it's not because jobs aren't available. It would be for another reason, such as a skill shortage or some other issue. But job availability is typically not a problem uh, for the, the average individual if the unemployment rate is around 5%. So this just illustrates how strong uh, the labor market is in, in South Carolina. We can also visualize that over time in these, these two black lines. Uh, so this is a, a graph of the unemployment rate in South Carolina going back to 1976. And you can see the two black lines here that show 3.3% unemployment uh, as well as 5% as unemployment. So most of the time we have seen uh, unemployment, again, around 5.8% on average, which suggests that a mild recession with a mild uptick in the unemployment rate would still uh, provide us with, uh, with a relatively strong labor market, historically speaking. Now, where, the other question is, why is this the case? Why have we been able to see an unemployment rate that has dipped so low? Where are all these people that are creating the, the labor shortage? Well, there's an interesting answer to that, and we can actually look at the data in a little bit more detail. And it turns out, uh, if we actually compare where we are in 2022 to right before the pandemic in 2019, uh, we estimate that there are about 80,000 what we would call missing workers in South Carolina. That is to say that we've continued to see population gains since 2019. We've continued to see growth in the labor force, but population gains have been outpacing the labor force. So we have fewer people in the labor force today than we would expect given uh, these changes in our labor force participation rate. So if the labor force participation rate had been consistent over time, we'd expect to have 80,000 more people. So that's where a lot of the labor shortage is coming from. If we put those 80,000 people back in uh, and, and recalculated the unemployment rate, it would actually be pretty close to 5%. So where are these 80,000 people? Well, if we do a little digging, we know something about them, not as much as we would like, but one thing we know is that about 60% of them, 59.5%, are over the age of 55. So these are people that we can consider uh, either, uh, th that are basically retired and are probably out of the labor force for uh, uh, permanently. They're, they're ones that are not coming back. And the example of, of these uh, types of individuals are those that may have been working going into the pandemic and because the stock market was doing so well in 2020 and 2021, and because they were probably concerned about getting sick from COVID, that may have motivated many of them to retire, either retire a few years earlier than they might have otherwise planned or retire when they were thinking of doing so anyway and, and perhaps get off the fence there. But of the remaining 40%, a sizable percentage uh, reports uh, relying on a spouse or a partner or other family for financial support as well. And the reason I bring that up is because what this implies together is that uh, only a small percentage of these missing workers are likely to be easily incentivized to come back into the labor market, which suggests that this labor shortage that we're seeing is likely to be a long run phenomenon to go far beyond 2023 and probably be with us for uh, the rest of the decade. It also implies, once again, that we will continue to have a historically strong job market from the perspective of individuals, so that a small uptick in unemployment uh, would still leave us with a, again, a, a fairly strong labor market as, as a whole. One other way we can see this, if we look at, uh, at population changes, this really illustrates some of the long run changes that we've seen in, in South Carolina. So this is not just a COVID related phenomenon. Um, this shows you the, the long run aging of, of South Carolina. Just looking at the population distribution by age. Um, so this breaks it down into three categories here. Um, and you can see the, the bar on the right hand side of your screen reflects those 55 and older. Just what percentage of the population falls into these different age brackets? And this reflects two phenomena. One, or phenomena. one is the general aging of the population at the national level, um, but also the fact that South Carolina uh, tends to see more retirees moving in from, from out of state. So there's a national or structural component of this as the population ages as a whole, 
Uh, but also this is partly because of factors in, in South Carolina that are relatively unique. But either way, we're seeing the, the population age, which again suggests that uh, the labor challenge that many businesses are facing uh, is likely to be uh, long term. So finally then, as we look ahead to 2023, how would we know when the unemployment rate is likely to begin ticking up when we see a significant pullback in, in the labor market? Well, one important leading indicator that I would urge all of you to track on a regular basis is the, the US job openings rate. Uh, and this is simply a measure of the number of jobs that are currently available and unfilled. And you can track this over time. And this shows us First, at first glance here, you can see very clearly why we have a labor shortage, because the job openings rate is far higher uh, than what we saw before the pandemic began, and far higher than normally what we would expect given an unemployment rate at the national level of 3.7%. Now, in 2022, because of these interest rate hikes, we have begun to see the job openings rate turn. It's not getting larger, it peaked, and we've seen it begun, uh, begin to, to come back down. But it still has a long way to go before it gets anywhere close to where we were before the, before the pandemic began. And I would suggest to you that this job openings rate, the difference between where it is now and where it was in 2020, is really somewhat of the, the wiggle room that the Federal Reserve has to continue to raise rates, or at least monitor rate increases, uh, before we see a significant pullback in demand and therefore a, uh, an increase in, in unemployment. So this is gonna be a very important metric to, to continue to watch. Again, the job openings rate, basically just a measure of the help wanted signs in, in the window. And from a business perspective, we usually would expect, again, usually, uh, that most businesses take the help wanted signs out of the window before they lay workers off, which is why we likely see this come down further before we see any uptick in unemployment uh, or any, hopefully, any major layoff activity overall. So wrapping up, as we look ahead to 2023, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that South Carolina's economy and the U.S. economy in general continue to uh, do very well. It's still in very good shape as we head into uh, 2023, but high inflation is still our biggest short-run economic threat in, in South Carolina. Uh, as we look ahead, we are anticipating the possibility of recession within the next 12 months to be greater than 50%, um, but in the event of a recession, we expect right now for it to be mild, again, barring any, any major unknown event that, uh, that could certainly occur. Uh, but right now, uh, again, a mild inflation, uh, rather mild recession likely in 2023 um, uh, with a probability of greater than 50%, and that's really the consensus among most economists that, that you will likely hear. Um, still a pent-up demand for services. Uh, the service sector, leisure and hospitality in general, has the, uh, has the wind in its back, relatively speaking, because we see the pendulum shifting away from goods and towards services. So this durable goods bubble that we've been experiencing over the past two years likely to continue to dissipate in the new year. And whether we see a further pullback in housing really is going to come down to uh, whether we see any uptick in unemployment or, or a significant pullback in the labor market. Because at the end of the day, when we're trying to forecast housing demand, the single best predictor that we have is still employment growth, the labor market as a whole. So we've already seen the housing market begin to adjust due to these rising interest rates and significant further pullback would likely result from a pullback in, in the labor market. So that's gonna be important to continue to monitor. And additional leading metrics that we need to be tracking in 2023, declines in consumer spending, again, reflecting about 70% of the total economy. Consumer spending is about 70% of GDP, um, so critical to, uh, to be tracking. Decreases in the job openings rate, as we already mentioned, and also increases in initial unemployment insurance claims. This is not a metric we talked about today, but that's another uh, measure of the number of layoffs that are happening in, in real time. And right now, initial unemployment insurance claims are still uh, essentially at pre-pandemic levels uh, and in a, very good, in a very good spot. But regardless, those are metrics that are going to be, continue to, uh, be important to continue to monitor as we move forward. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. And depending on time, um, be happy to take one or two questions. Are we okay on time or? No, we're a little over time. Okay. <laughs>
We'll have time for questions when we reconvene in 15 minutes. That'll be what, what about uh, 2.20? We'll, we'll come back and we'll have our, what's that? Okay, so uh, Dr. Von Nessen will be back up here, but when we come back, we have our keynote speaker, Barbara Melvin from uh, the CEO of the Ports. Uh, so we'll see you at 2.20. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm now pleased to say uh, we are going to start our second part of our program, uh, beginning with our featured speaker, our keynote speaker today, Barbara Melvin. Uh, let me start by just saying, you know, since colonial times, our port in South Carolina has been a major asset that boosts economic development in all areas of the state. No one is in a better position to see how our state's economy is doing than the leader of our port. Barbara Melvin, President and CEO of uh, the South Carolina Ports, just since July 2022, this year. But still, well, not exactly. Previously, you served as the Chief Operating Officer, so you were there since 2018. So many accomplishments I could mention about Barbara, but just tick off a few here. First woman to lead a top 10 U.S. operating container port. Uh, among many other awards and honors, uh, she was the 2021 South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance Woman of the Year. She holds a master's in business administration and supply chain from the University of Tennessee, a top-ranked program up there with ours. We have a very good supply. You're hiring our graduates, aren't you? I hope. Uh, and as CEO, COO, and now CEO, uh, the port has boomed um, recently under Barbara's tenure. It's good to have someone with expertise in supply chain these days since there's so much in the news and so much interest and concern about what's happened over the last year, but also what's going to happen going forward into 2023. Um, but despite all the problems we've had in the economy in this COVID period, our port has remained the linchpin of the South Carolina economy. And Barbara's position overseeing the port gives her a unique perspective uh, on South Carolina's prospects and challenges. So please join me in welcoming Barbara Melvin as our keynote speaker. Good afternoon. I always get worried when somebody starts um, to introduce me with in colonial times. Because I was like, is he going to talk about my age? Is he going to talk about how long I've been at the port? Um, but no, thank you so much. Um, what a great opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, there is no greater topic in the news than supply chain of late. I think we successfully replaced all of the pandemic experts, and we allowed folks to talk and become supply chain experts. And you know, we were hidden for forever. Nobody even knew what supply chain was. I mean, it was originally logistics, then it was transportation, well, actually it was reverse, transportation, then logistics, now supply chain. And you know, I'll say, shame on us if we don't in this industry take advantage of this crisis and really continue to bring the best and the brightest into our industry so that we have diverse ideas and new ideas. Uh, to address a lot of the challenges that we can turn into opportunities so that we learn what's going on. You know, it's always difficult to follow Dr. Van Essen, or as we call him, Joey. Um, he is amazing. You are so lucky to have him at the university. We utilize him um, along with our board, and Felicia Howard speaks next. She's one of our board members. Um, we utilize Joey to help us kind of fact check our thinking about what might our volume be the next year? What should we expect in consumer trends? Because a lot of what the port does is dependent on consumer behavior. So he's just an amazing asset for our state. And I congratulate you all for um, keeping him here as we all need to try to do at the University of South Carolina. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, Joey threw a little shade on our industry, uh, so we're going to try to teach you about what uh, we did at the South Carolina Port to overcome the challenges that still exist in a lot of supply chains today, because here in South Carolina we're a bit unique. 
um, as, as Doug shared with you, um, we are an operating port here in South Carolina. And what that means is we have a lot better control over the way that we deal with our assets, how they're utilized. And through that, we have been able to overcome some supply chain challenges that other ports have not been able to tackle. OK, buckle up. Here we go. Um, you can leave the uh, shipping to me. But I think to learn a little bit about the South Carolina ports, you have to understand what is top of mind for us every day and those strategic priorities and performance metrics that we utilize to see if we're doing a good job. Because we all know what gets measured gets done. So our strategic priorities are pretty simple. There are only four. And by the way, if you move through life having more than maybe four or five strategic priorities, they're not priorities, they are tasks. So make sure that when you prioritize something, it is exactly what you're going to be doing. So advancing operational excellence, growing and anchoring our cargo base, delivering critical infrastructure, and then taking care of our people. And by our people, I mean not just South Carolina Ports Authority employees, but our entire maritime community. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those priorities as we move through the presentation. I thought I would share with you a, a snapshot of how we've been doing at the South Carolina Port during the last three years, absent 2020. Of course, that should not necessarily be utilized in any type of comparison, because we should throw that year away for many reasons. Um, but if you look at FY19 and then make your way all the way to FY22, we have been booming. Every one of those years was a record year for us. So when we talk about maybe we won't do quite as well as we did in FY22, that may still result in a record for us. Because last year's great performance tends to lead to this year's poor comparisons. And we really had a phenomenal performance, not only in our peer containers, and so you'll hear me toggle between peer containers and TEUs. So TEUs is a 20-foot equivalent unit, and TEUs is usually two peer containers. So you'll always see a higher number in 20-foot equivalent units because most of the boxes that we move or peer containers are 40 foot. That's what you see on the roads, uh, on top of chassis, et cetera. So if you just look, you know, we were expecting, because everybody staffed, and, you know, in your normal day-to-day -day work, you staff for your expectation of business. So in FY21, we were staffed up for that 1.42 million pure containers. And then during the pandemic, as we still didn't know what was going to happen, you know, we didn't hire because we couldn't train. So then on top of what was a record year and a very busy year for us, We've moved an additional extra 100,000 beer containers on the very same amount of people. So one could say that the temperature at the South Carolina port during FY22 was pretty high um, because folks were really tired. And so that was um, one of the challenges that we had to overcome. But these folks moved these boxes. And that was the entire maritime community that came together to do that. Break bulk tons exceeded expectations in 22 over 21. And you would wonder, well, why is that? They couldn't get space on container ships. So commodities that used to move break bulk, colonial times, um, actually went back that way because they could find space on vessels as to where they could not move their cargo on container ships. Our inland ports did well. Even in, if you think about South Carolina and our dependency on automotive, our inland ports still performed quite strongly, even through all of the automotive supply chain challenges. Passengers, how about this? Wake up one day in the middle of your fiscal year or your budget year and learn that $10 million of your expected revenue is gone like that. Well, that's what happened with our cruise passengers because they were simply shut down by the CDC. But when it came back, you know, you saw all those folks on the news saying, I'll never get back on a cruise ship. Well, I can assure you, first-hand knowledge. First week, they were at 70% occupancy. Second week, they were at 85. And finally, on that third week, and since then, they have been at full occupancy coming out of Charleston. So as you heard from Dr. Van Essen, 
kind of that service side, vacation, all of that has come back quite strongly and very effectively. And then vehicles, we still did very well and fully set up vehicles here in South Carolina through our automotive supply chain. So this next slide really just shows you a little bit more distinctly what our key volumes were from last fiscal year. So nothing additional there, but I just thought, in case y'all were pulling out your cameras, you might wanna see that. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to share with you kind of our performance throughout the years. And really, even though I said we should throw out 2020, when you look at that quite distinct stair step of growth that we have seen in our TEUs since 2013, it's pretty impressive. Um, it's something that we can all be proud of as a state. And it really reflects, again, what Dr. Von Essen said about the state of our state's economy, which is um, very strong. And really, I think um, it's a lesson for all of us to not fall for generalizations about performance in the economy. Because I think that we will continue to see winners and losers as we move forward, where some states will outperform kind of US general metrics. Um, and the ports are a very strong storyline inside of that. Our next slide, it's kind of fun. You can look for a lot of the names and logos that are um, something that you can re identify with. These are importers and exporters throughout our state. And what it really shows you is the significant amount of economic impact that ports have uh, on their states, and particularly here in South Carolina. So we are a juggernaut for foreign direct investment here, and that typically translates into port use. You know, the majority, uh, more than 50% of our economic impact is seen in the upstate. Um, and then if you look at the other regions, it is quite strong, whether that be the Midlands, then the Low Country, then the PD. So um, we're very proud of that fact. One in 10 jobs is either directly or indirectly supported by the port. So our existence here matters in the way that we attract industry and attract jobs. And then I think the thing that we're most proud of is that we pay about 35% higher than the average South Carolinian's wage. So that's the difference. In a, in a career for someone and the ability to pay for a home and the ability to send their children on to college, whether that be a technical school or a four-year school. So just wanted to share that. And that, by the way, was performed. This economic impact study was done right here at the University of South Carolina, led by Dr. Joey Von Essen. So I want to talk to you a little bit about operational excellence, because you may say to yourself, why in the world would a port need to remind itself to work well. But the supply chain elevated and highlighted the fact that a lot of ports don't work well. I mean, how many times did you see that CNBC picture of more than 100 ships off the coast of LA Long Beach? Looked like the Normandy invasion, if folks remember that. Um, you know, it was just, it was tragic because it was really not necessarily the port's fault. They didn't have any new infrastructure to handle what was a significant amount of additional imports that were coming in. Nobody called them and said, hey, we're going to divert a lot of ships that take transit times to the East Coast at 30 days versus 14 days to LA Long Beach. Nobody called and said, hey, do you have room? They just started coming. And so the ports were trying to catch as catch can at that point. But it was too late. Um, but I thought you know, it would be really great for you to see what do the top 10 ports in the United States look like? And it's pretty amazing that Charleston sits on the list with all of these very big cities. Because imports go to where people live, and exports typically come from where people don't live. The exception in the United States to that is the Southeast region, although our population base is growing significantly. And exports, while they suffered during the pandemic, will continue to be a focus for the United States and a true indicator of economic success of our country is when we can export our goods to emerging markets. And emerging markets do want our food products um, and other things that we enjoy here on the western side of the world um, as an indicator of the fact that their economies are improving. So there's a couple other things I want to point out. These top 10 ports handle 85% of containers for the United States. So what does that mean? Not a lot of crumbs, 
left for a lot of ports that you know and don't see on that list. And then I think even more importantly, on the right, that would be, yes, your right-hand side of the slide, is that our compounded annual growth, in the, if you look at kind of ours is extremely high, but it's also high along the East Coast. So when you hear this story about market shift, Asia goods from West Coast over to East Coast, this is real. And every time there's a hiccup, whether that hiccup is caused by the port's actions or not, so either natural or unnatural, even though some goods do swing back to the West Coast, not all of them go every time. So that market share for the East Coast for Asia continues to grow, and we believe firmly that within the next five years that the East and Gulf Coast combined will be equal to Asia imports to the West Coast, and that's a significant shift in our country. This next slide, again, just very quickly, it, um, it's an important indicator for us um, because as ships got larger, we did not expect to see more of them. We did expect to see higher move counts on each ship, and so this indicates per vessel docked the significant increase in the number of boxes that we moved on average for each vessel versus what we were seeing just the year before. So that is a, a very good indicator of success and truly a reflection that the story that we've been telling in South Carolina about the need to make investments in a deeper harbor, in more capacity in our terminals, in our rail capability, in our, in, on our land side infrastructure capability, it was true that if you make these investments, if you are successful, you will get a larger share of the cargo that is out there. I also wanted to share with you a slide that shows kind of the three-year trend by month of import volume into the United States. And you can see, um, you know, people always talk about when will the congestion in the ports end. And it's pretty simple. You know, there's a lot of talking heads who will tell you more than this, but if you can keep this in mind, you'll know. Currently, given no additional capacity in terminals, the U.S. can import fluidly about 2 million TEUs a month. So anytime that line is above that, that's like trying to push more goods through your warehouse or more clothes into your closet than you have space for. So if you got more clothes and you hadn't gone to Goodwill, you've got congestion in your closet. Same thing with a port. If you're trying to push two million, more than two million TEUs into the United States per month, it's going to create congestion. And just look at that. I mean, more than 13 months, we saw greater than two million TEUs a month. So it's easy to explain the congestion. And so, of course, when will it go away? When we're importing less than that. And that's not necessarily a great thing for the economy, but that's what will happen to the supply chain. Busy slide next, and we won't go over all these points, but I think it's important to note that when there are great challenges, it calls for creative solutions. And so a lot of people did finger pointing when the supply chain became congested. And that was really tempting for us as well. But as an operating port, what we saw was a lot of additional revenue come to us, non-recurring revenue from storage. So boxes weren't moving. It's just like if you park at an airport and you choose to park closest to the terminal, you're gonna pay more per hour or per day. That's the same with a marine terminal. If you leave your box on a marine terminal, then you're gonna pay heavily for it. So we had a lot of boxes that stayed longer than they were supposed to. So we took that revenue, because it was not earmarked for bonds or any other um, purpose, and we knew it wouldn't be there year after year, so you don't want to apply it to your employees. And we said, we're going to put some solutions in place. And we really took the shotgun approach. We threw a bunch of stuff against the wall, whether that be with our ocean carriers, with vessels, gate hours, motor carriers, um, or railroads. It didn't matter. We tried a lot of stuff. And these issues that you see on, that, on the screen now are the ones that worked. And there's really no secret sauce to it. It just took money, it took a lot of positive encouragement, 
And we really just had to start thinking about how could we care about others in the supply chain and what could we productively do to help them manage the congestion that they were seeing downstream from us or if, an, if you were an exporter, upstream to us. And that became things like a $217 million investment in chassis. Anybody know what a chassis is? Everybody know what a chassis is? Okay, can't move a box without it. They're considered to be a utility. And for more than a decade, South Carolina's participated with other states in a chassis pool. So it was called the South Atlantic, Southeast region. You can amazingly still see um, kind of the stenciling on a lot of chassis from more than 20 years ago. So that lets you know how old the asset is that is on the road. Well, we were participating in that pool and we wanted to upgrade the equipment. And because we were just one state participating, we couldn't drive that storyline anymore. So we said, enough. So we, we as a state, at the, um, with, allowed by our board to do so, invested $217 million in new chassis. So not a cheap investment, pretty bold move that we did in very little time to try to take what was a utility in our industry, can't move a box without it, and turn that into a competitive advantage for us. And we successfully did that by injecting about 5,000 new assets on the road when no one else was investing in chassis and couldn't get them here. We added Sunday gate hours. We laughed all the time when folks would get on the national news and say, hey, the port should keep their gates open at night or the port should be open on Saturday. I'm like, we've been open on Saturdays for like 10 years. You know, motor carriers have lives too. They needed an option of when they could additionally drive. Warehouses were working 24 seven. Well, the bottleneck becomes the port if we're not open on Sundays to be able to give folks the ability to get their box. So when others were reacting, we had to react too. Same with our railroads. Be proud of CSX and Norfolk Southern. I know you live in Columbia and you're challenged at times getting stopped by the railroad. But understand that they're moving some critical boxes on those trains. Maybe, you know, tra nobody minds a train when it's moving, right? You mind it when it's stopped in front of you because you have no idea when it's going to start again. But just know that NS and CSX during the supply chain crisis that we saw in Charleston, which was about five months, December of 21 through the end of April of 22, so just April of this year, they reacted positively to help us. Our inland ports helped us. Hiring 150 additional operators helped us. Purchasing three simulators to help us train our people when we couldn't put them in a piece of equipment side by side um, because of COVID concerns, because we couldn't get our workforce sick. They had to be there. We were moving that essential cargo uh, to keep consumers um, full of goods. So those are the types of things that we did. And be proud that as an operating port, we were able to implement those because we had control of our assets. We had control of those productivity levers. So what did that translate into um, for key indicators for us for the fiscal year? So now we're going to be on the far right side on, uh, of the slide. I know we moved inward in the previous one. But, you know, of that is new on this slide, just look. So the first time we exceeded $300 million in revenues was in 21. And then just look at the jump that we saw in 22. That's that non-recurring revenue I was talking about. That's storage. And so we took those funds, majority of those funds, and put them back into the maritime community, whether that be the motor carriers or others, to help keep cargo moving. Because ports' jobs are not to store boxes. Our job is to keep cargo flowing. So that was how we utilized our revenues. First time we exceeded, so operating cash flow for us is like earnings for another business. We exceeded $100 million for the first time in 21. Look at that big jump. So, and you know, we expect that huge decline that we're showing for 23 is because we do believe and are seeing those storage costs coming down, you know, what we were collecting in storage. So that's actually a good thing. And then lastly, you know, we eat cash as a port. Our, um, one of our leads in our finance department made a joke the other day. I was saying, I was saying something about $28 million. This will scare you. 
And she was like, oh, Barbara, we can't do anything for $28 million. And then I take that home with me, and my husband's like, it really starts to bother me, Barbara, that you talk about you know, millions of dollars like it's sofa change. <laughs> it's like, you got to realize when you're at home and when you're at work. So anyway, that's just an aside. So uh, the next slide is, is, is very busy, but I'm just going to point out a couple of key things. So when I was sharing with you that we were seeing that congestion here in South Carolina, just like what you're still seeing in other ports, um, you, it's pretty easy to see if you, we are showing here on this slide what our terminals look like in January of this year versus what it looks like today. You know, we had double the amount of import inventory that was sitting on our terminals. We had almost double the amount of export inventory. Empties don't look at that because anytime you're handling an import, you're going to get that empty back. So that's going to stay pretty consistent, but it was elevated. So you can easily understand why there was congestion. We had a ship queue in January of 16 ships going to the Wando terminal. That wasn't the height of our congestion. At one point, we had more than 30 ships. I was a bit of a basket case during that point, but we worked through it. And we worked through it with our ocean carriers by creating an express berth, by requiring our ocean carriers to take out as much as they were putting down. Because there were days where we were watching a box go out the gate, and then we're like, you can put the box down now, off the ship. It was just that tight. Um, I think it's critical to point out uh, our motor carrier turn times. So our goal is always, regardless of mission, under an hour. And we had started to exceed an hour. If you think five minutes don't matter, become a motor carrier. Because they only get paid if they're moving. They don't get paid if they're sitting. And a difference between six moves a day and seven moves a day is an additional $100 of revenue for them. It matters. Five minutes every hour, we're open 12 hours a day, adds up very quickly. And so these metrics matter. And then the last thing I'll show you is this is the most amazing story. We maintain all of our own equipment. We have industrial electricians and, and heavy lift mechanics that do so for us. And our equipment got no rest. So to have a more than 99.5% reliability on our equipment when it was under order, so in, in use, is amazing. So when you get in your car and that little check engine light comes on, don't put a business card over it, because you really do need it to work when you need it to work. And this showed the importance of maintaining and preventive maintenance on equipment, because when we needed it, it was there. This next slide is just kind of the same story of our other container terminal in North Charleston. Not much different there. Um, but bringing those creative solutions to light allowed our congestion to clear up after five months. And again, our neighbors on the East Coast to the north and to the south of us that are major container ports that you saw in that top 10 list are still experiencing significant congestion off their coast, as well as Houston. So it is all about not finger pointing and bringing those creative solutions to light. So capacity for a port is its currency. And when we go talk to customers, and particularly importers and exporters, because we have two tiers of customers. Ocean carriers pay us, so they're like the critical customer that we chase. But importers and exporters, located here in South Carolina and throughout the Southeast, they drive ship calls. So there's this relationship that cannot be broken between the two, whether the importer and exporter pays us or not. So when we talk about capacity, currently today, we have more than three and a half million, and I'm at TEUs now, of capacity that we offer our customers. And then planned and permitted, by 2033, an additional 2 million TEUs of capacity. And then with the help of South Carolina Department of Transportation, by 2040, as we make improvements to 526, we open up additional capacity that exists today in the past um, that has been hampered by the size of ships. So as we make improvements to 526 and create some additional space between 
the water level of the harbor and the top of that second bridge in Charleston on 526, we'll be able to put larger ships at North Charleston. And renovating an existing facility is much cheaper than building a new one, about at least half the cost, if not more, as my CFO gets nervous every time I talk about that. So why is this important? When Harry Lightsey, the Secretary of Commerce, is talking to a new importer or exporter on foreign direct investment, he has to say, if you put capital in the ground in South Carolina, our infrastructure can grow with you. People have to have that confidence. And this sheet alone shows the world that South Carolina can handle their growth and that we're here to grow with them when they make those significant capital investments. So transitioning to our second priority, which is growing and anchoring our cargo base, to echo some of what Joey shared with you, um, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, particularly um, in the import category, so the, the bottom part of that slide, what was the major category of import? It was furniture during the pandemic. You want to know why? We all started to pay attention to what was behind us when we were in those Zoom meetings, and whether that be the sofa or the artwork or the vase with the flowers, I mean, because people started rating you. They were like, oh, that looks good. They look good. You know, and that would go up on Twitter because somebody would take a picture of that Hollywood Square moment, and that just shows my age. We can say Brady Bunch, too, where all of you are lined up on the Zoom. People started taking pictures of that, whether you knew it or not, and then they would rate your living room. Well, we all got really nervous about that, and we ordered more furniture than we knew what to do with. And so it all became imports into ports. And additionally, because we couldn't do anything else, we bought recreational equipment, whether that be a bike or a paddleboard or a kayak, anything that we could do outside with our family. So we improved our backyards and we improved our living rooms. And so that was really the significant good that you can see there as a trend on the slide. And then exports, South Carolina um, is amazing for exports, whether that's forest products, agricultural products, chemicals, all of those types of things that we do very, very well here, not only in South Carolina, but in the Southeast. And then you can see on kind of the, the wheel there, the mix of our cargo. And really for the first time, you know, when you think about South Carolina, you think more about European companies than you do about Asian companies. But when you combine Asia, Southeast Asia, and the India subcontinent, our, our cargo mix now is more than 50% related to those countries. So Europe's still being very, very strong for us, but it's interesting to see how cargo mixes have shifted over the years. So as we have looked at that cargo mix that we handle, we made a decision about four or five years ago to really try to get into the retail business, and we have to. Because if you think about GDP manufacturing, although we grew one for one on the backs of advanced manufacturing here in South Carolina, very proudly, by the way, retail consumption is 35% of GDP. And that's just the good side. Services are the other side, so that makes up 70% of GDP. We had to transition. If you remember what I told you about imports go where people live, you think to yourself, okay, South Carolina is 5.2 million people, am I right? Is that right? 5.2 million people? You're like, eh, how do we fight in that game? Because if you take Atlanta out of Georgia, we're pretty similar, but we don't have an Atlanta. Do you know how we did it? We did it because you are buying differently. You want your good not in two weeks for free shipping like we did when we were all growing up. Not y'all growing up, by the way, not that table, but <laughs> these tables. When we were growing up, two weeks for free was great. We were happy with that kind of a shipping pattern. And we didn't mind going to a retail store to pick up our good. But today, and particularly during the pandemic, e-commerce omnichannel changed everything. And now people want their goods in two days for free, sometimes a day, depending on what you're paying for. And in some cities, you can get it in two hours. And that footprint in a warehouse or a fulfillment center, as they're now called, is a much greater footprint than just a typical warehouse that serves a store. A store knows exactly what they're gonna get every week. 
They can easily take inventory, they know what's off the shelves, and they know what to pull from a DC, a distribution center. Consumers are much harder to predict. So inside of that fulfillment center, they need a lot more SKUs or products because they're not quite sure what you might order that day and they have this obligation to deliver the good to you within a certain amount of time. And if they don't do it, you're gonna hop to the next big box store with a better e-commerce game than the one that you just tried because consumers have choices and they're gonna go with the person that performs. And so South Carolina, even though we don't have a huge population, what we do have is fantastic infrastructure, a working port, and the ability to now serve less people in the population with that fulfillment center. So fulfillment centers typically now locate anywhere there's a million people within a metropolitan statistical area. So you'll hear that from an Amazon, you'll hear that from a Walmart, you'll hear that from a Target, those people who really have big box games. And the bad news that came out of the pandemic was those stores really took more and more market share from smaller businesses. But you did see a lot of small businesses partner and increase their e-commerce game. And so hopefully what we will see is continued improvements in that area in technology so that um, all size businesses can take advantage of this trend of e-commerce. So when we tacked into retail, we decided why not target the top people? And so we worked for about three and a half to four years with a lot of folks on our staff and we went after Walmart the number one importer into the US, and we landed them. And we landed them in a place called Ridgeville, South Carolina. And they built a more than three million square foot distribution center. You can see it there. It's tremendous if you have not seen it. You don't have to drive far up the interstate to view it. So 2.8 million square feet of distribution in that very large building that you see there, and then transloading there, that little baby to the left, um, is 200,000 square feet. So they'll take a, a, a shipping container into that small building, get the goods out of the shipping container, transload them either into domestic trucks or store them in the warehouse and move out from there. So that was a great win for us. Then we decided why not, no pun intended, target number two, which is actually target. And they needed a very creative solution, again, a word that you'll hear me say often, um, to have uh, a warehouse up and running for peak season this year. Well, peak season is just another term in retail for holiday season. Well, holiday season didn't really occur this year because people were front loading or forwarding inventory into the US because of supply chain concerns throughout the year. Um, but we delivered them in less than eight months a new building, and it is uh, a temporary warehouse, but we were able to, to do that as uh, an operating port. And then we worked with Amazon, and we put Amazon on our Wando terminal. And we are performing for them what we call a kick the tire service, because we feel like they'll continue to invest here in South Carolina if we perform and help them meet the expectations of their customers. And I think it's important too to remember that we have to protect port dependent land. And that doesn't necessarily, since we're located on the peninsula, have to be right adjacent to the port but it does need to be along that corridor that transitions from an international move to a domestic move. So from a company's perspective, it always was thought that you had to be very near the port. But we have been able to tell that story that it really doesn't matter which bucket of transportation that cost goes into, domestic or international, the goods still have to flow off a peninsula up 26 into um, the population centers. So those are the types of things that we've been working on as a port and with our state is to try to tell that story. And then this next slide just depicts what South Carolina and our port really handle from an export perspective. And amazingly, we do handle resins out of the Gulf because our railroads rail them here. We have a huge supply of empties. They transload them from rail cars and then we ship them out because of the diversification of our ocean carrier services. We ship them out around the world from here. So that is another thing that we do very well. Moving into delivering critical infrastructure. So those are the things that you see for a port and the things that you don't see. So we were speaking earlier about what is the importance of technology? Well, ports rely heavily on advanced technology measures to make sure that we work well. 
Like, how in the world do we keep up with where the boxes are? How do we share information? It used to be EDI, and now it's API. Um, so there are very, um, a, very many measures that we are taking internally to, me to make sure that our information technology systems are on the cutting edge of what we need. Uh, and that is always an interesting conversation because technology scares everybody. You know, when you get that email on Friday that they're going to be working on the email system over the weekend, you know on Monday when you get there something's going wrong. So try launching like a new gate system so you can exponentially Im imagine what it's like. But let's talk a little bit about the major capital initiatives that you do see that we were able to accomplish. And so all the check marks make us very happy because during the last six years, we've embarked on a more than $2 billion capital plan to accomplish the growth that you saw in some of the earlier slides. And whether that was refurbishing the Wando terminal, so modernizing it, when it was opened in the late 70s, early 80s, the largest ship that it saw was a 3,000 TEU ship. And now it's regularly seeing a 14, 15, sometimes 16,000 TEU ship. Um, and as a matter of fact, we were just uh, able to dock three 14,000 TEU ships at one time at the Wando, and that was a major accomplishment for us. We opened the first new Greenfield container terminal in the U.S. since 2009 in April of 21, the Leatherman Terminal. That's just phase one. We have phases two and three, so that middle column of the capacity slide that I shared with you for 2023, 2033, that's phases two and three of the Leatherman Terminal that will open. Just yesterday, we celebrated the completion of our harbor deepening project that began in 2010. I was really young then, uh, by the way. But we are now the deepest harbor on the U.S. East Coast. That's a pretty amazing thing. For every additional foot of depth that we can offer our ocean carrier customers, that's 100 additional loaded boxes. That's found revenue for an ocean carrier. So that's a competitive advantage for us. And exports are always heavier than imports. So if we're serious as a country about having a strong exporting region, you have to have a port in each region that has that depth to accommodate uh, the heavy exports. We have two inland ports, one on the NS line up in Greer, South Carolina, that mainly when initiated supported the automotive industry and really now supports a lot of retail along with the automotive industry. And then on the CSX line in Dillon, South Carolina, we have um, a, a newer inland port that is making its way. You know, there's a couple of advantages for Dillon. First of all, we have a dual mission at the South Carolina ports. It's not only to move waterborne freight, but it's really to invest in economic development. And Dillon was an area of our state that needed a hand up, not a handout. And so when we located there, a lot of warehousing started to be interested. Um, they had a base tenant in Harbor Freight Tools with now more than 3 million square feet of um, DC under roof. And we're right there on the North Carolina border. And guess what South Carolina and North Carolina do very well? We export. So we're poaching. Sorry if there's anybody from North Carolina here. But we thought with our water depth and that rail connectivity, we were well positioned to take those exports, put them in the empty Harbor Freight Tools import boxes that are going to that 3 million square foot DC, put them back on the rail line and get them to Charleston. And it's working. It's working. It'll take time, but it's working. And Dillon is growing, and we're really proud of the investments that we've made there. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the three things that don't have a check mark. So our smart pool. This is more about our chassis program, that $217 million investment I talked about. We're putting 12,000 new assets on the road. So when you see our logo, you can't miss it on the white mud flap. Be, feel safe. It's a new asset. It's got anti-lock brakes, LED lights. Um, and all of the equipment necessary to make it a safe asset beside you on the road. We are leasing an additional 1,700 chassis that are less than three years old that met our specs. So this pool is innovative, it is safe, and it will be effective for our customers. The Navy Base Intermodal Facility was funded by our General Assembly at to the tune of $400 million. We are taking the NS rail ramp and the CSX rail ramp that exist today in separate locations in Charleston and combining them near dock to the Leatherman Terminal so that the rail cargo that comes in and out of there does not have to go over the road. Even if it's going to a different terminal, we will move it by barge 
or at least a great percentage of that by barge that does not have to be timely or just in time cargo like the automotive sector. We move a lot of intermodal cargo that is not day one or priority one cargo. So we'll utilize an alternative to just truck. And so that has environmental advantages. It has length of the life of that infrastructure advantages for roads. It's a quality of life advantage around our, our area, just like our inland ports are. And then it's important for our customers to show that they too are looking at environmental initiatives that benefit not only cargo movement, um, but our natural resources. A little bit more on the next slide about our future container barge operation. Um, the capital side of that was covered by an additional $150 million from our state legislature. Thank them if you see them, if you are a port lover, because they really take the time to understand what we do, and they make these, gener these generational investments in port infrastructure to help South Carolina continue to grow with uh, that economic impact that we provide in mind. So we're going to build some additional berth space, only the marginal wharf space at the Wando Terminal to the north so that we don't interrupt ship operations. We'll advance the construction of an additional berth at our new terminal so that um, come July of 2025, when that new rail facility opens, we can have kind of like the Staten Island Ferry move in uh, intermodal cargo by barge. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a, the, we have applied for a grant that we hope to hear about very soon. It's called a mega grant. And all of our grants in the U.S. seem to be in the Witness Protection Program because the names change every year. But this one is uh, for $149 million. And what we're looking to do is reduce the operating costs of a barge operation. Because if you think about it, a truck is more competitive from a cost perspective because you just touch that box once. For a barge, you touch it more than once. So every time you touch a box, a container, you're adding cost. So if we can reduce our operating costs by having the tug, the barge, and then we're looking to do this um, through EV, because that is a, a concentrated effort on our state's part to move into that technology, we have asked for the solar array charging stations on both sides of the harbor uh, for the tug and barge system. So uh, keep your fingers crossed, read your newspapers, hopefully we'll get that announcement soon. One other thing that we're really proud of as well is a, a major challenge. People always ask me, what keeps you up at night? I would tell you that the availability of motor carriers keeps me up at night. And the reason being, everything that we do involves a truck move, even if it has a rail component to it. And they stay top of mind for us every day because this country will stop economically without sufficient motor carrier power and capability. So inside, in a little piece of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, there was a provision that allowed for um, 3,000 apprenticeship slots across the country to address this age gap that happens in the availability and, and ability legally to move containers because of its, its a non-divisible load international cargo. It has a different delineation. And so we have been saying for years, you can't make a driver wait to 26 to get in this industry. We've lost them. They have found another career, another skill by the time they're 26. So under this program, we are working um, with the USDOT, with our South Carolina Trucking Association, and initially with Trident Tech, but we will move this into other technical schools to really get more than our fair share of those 3,000 slots at the port because of the way we drive our rail cargo to um, the railheads today. It's a closed loop system. So we're gonna hire these drivers once they have their CDL. We'll keep them on board with us for a couple of years, let them get their hours under a mentor, and then they'll move out like a farm team into our container industry. And they'll have to stay there for a few years based on the investment that we'll be making in them and the, and the technical school will have made in them. Um, but then once they do that, they can move into whatever career they choose. So we're creating a farm system in South Carolina to allow for the training of drivers at younger ages than what we see today. And so you would say, you know, what, what's on our, you've done so much. Well, guess what? As a top 10 port, you can't sit by and do nothing and just 
look at the past victories as what will sustain you. So with our eye to the future, what are we doing now? Um, there is a new interchange that we're working with SCDOT to have access to our Wando terminal that will no longer interfere with some of the residential traffic that is along Long Point Road. We have to build out the rest of our Ridgeville Industrial Campus. So we owned the land that Walmart located on in Ridgeville. We have another half of that to go. Ideally, we are looking for an exporter to take those empty import containers, fill them with cargo, and bring them back to the port to save those empty miles. Uh, so that's a, something that we're concentrating on. Of course, building phases two and three of the Leatherman Terminal, like we talked about, implementing the barge and dual rail served intermodal facility, or NBIF. And then eventually, we'll continue our talks with the state of Georgia about the Jasper Ocean Terminal. So no lack of things to do. And finally, the last pillar in our strategic plan is something that we're working really hard on. Most of the time when people think about the port, they truly just think about the South Carolina ports. And we're just one link in that supply chain. And what has become so evident, at least I hope so, in the US is that it doesn't matter how great one link is if the chain itself is not strong. So we want folks to think more about our maritime community as a whole and not just the South Carolina port. When we talk about how many people are working in and out of our terminals on a daily basis, it's 10,000 people. It's the size of the Boeing workforce. That is amazing. But if you just talk about the South Carolina port, we're only 950 people. So we really want that broader spotlight on our maritime community because that is the secret sauce of our success. Thank you. Can you take questions? I'm happy to take questions. And then we'll watch for the hook. Yes, sir. Hey. Okay. <laughs> There's always one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, we're an operating port. We talked about that. Other ports are landlord ports. And in those landlord ports, all the jobs are performed by union labor, whether on the West Coast, that's the ILWU, or on the East and Gulf Coast, it's called the ILA. So really only in about three ports on the East and Gulf Coast, Georgia, Wilmington, and us, are there these hybrid situations where state workers are in the productivity levers of the equipment. When there was a, the last contract that governed the labor on the East and Gulf Coast was renewed, there was a provision that said that any new container terminal capacity would be operated by the ILA, so like it was in other ports. Well, we chose to challenge that, which we should, um, because that was a contract signed between two parties to which we were not a part of, so they can't determine our fate. This, by the way, the story is in no way should be taken as a reflection on our partners in the ILA. This is just um, having the model stay the same as we have today is all we were looking for. Um, that has been sent to the National Labor Relations Board with the first determination by an ALJ in our favor that that type of action. So Walmart and Target can't sign a contract that has uh, an impairment on Amazon. You, know, you can't do that as a third party. So we've challenged that to the National Labor Relations Board, but in life, legal solutions aren't always um, they don't bring you the best results. So first of all, if you don't have a lot of time, that's not a good thing. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, if you win, what are you winning? So I may win this issue, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'll get more cargo. Because people don't like unrest in the supply chain. They don't like risk. There's no reward in supply chain for risk. And I'm looking at my young supply chain students to let you know that. Now, you still should take intelligent risks, but there's not a lot of reward in that. The situation that we're in 
is probably not going to call for a legal solution. It's going to call for building of relationships. It's going to call for um, growing more together rather than disproportionately as more jobs are available and as we grow. And it's going to call for some time because we um, traditionally have not had a very strong relationship with our labor workforce. We have always had a strong relationship locally. We have never known the leadership of the ILA and they sit in the Northeast. So that's what's happening right now. I can't give you a date. I can't give you uh, an ultimate answer, but what I can tell you is this. Uh, you can probably tell by listening to me. I'm an optimistic person by nature, but I am a realist as well. But I am still extremely optimistic that we will find a way to fully utilize our terminal. Our jobs will grow. Our ILA partners will continue to grow, and South Carolina will retain its, its competitive advantage by being able to control the assets that we have all invested in as a state. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> well, I'll let, yeah, you, I'll let you pick. <laughs> uh, uh, Jim is, is me. Okay, I got you. I am a port lover. First, let me tell you, it was cool. This, I drove up from Charleston this morning. And I drove up from Charleston this morning, and it was just amazing to go across on Interstate 526 and look at all the infrastructure that you built. I merged onto 26. I see a, a train as far as the eye can see, double stacked with containers. That was a 9,700-foot train this morning. Oh, amazing. And then I got on the interstate, and of course, I'm surrounded by trucks. But um, at any rate, it was, uh, it was very cool. My question is, um, you know, Given the nature of the uh, of the pandemic, uh, the issue of outsourcing, strategic outsourcing, you know, we we've spent uh, much of my adult life globalizing and passing off, uh, you know, uh, jobs and things uh, to other countries at the lowest price. Now we're looking more at oh, that didn't, doesn't work as much, you know, just enough, just in time, doesn't work that well. So the re resourcing back to the United States or other areas. Is um, is on the minds of a lot of people for security reasons and others, economic. Uh, what do you have any comments on that and how that might impact uh, on the port? Port you have alluded to it already, but I uh, didn't say anything specific to that. So there's room for all of that. You know, I think it's an extremely laudable goal for the United States to want to bring essential manufacturing and industrial productivity back. Um, and who's to automatically then think that instead of us importing that product, why can't I export it? I can. If it's made in the U.S., the U.S. can source that export around the world through our port. So if, it's, if you're asking the question for am I concerned as a port that I might lose goods from another country from an import perspective, no. Because I think and always will have faith in this country that if we're going to do that, we're going to replace that manufacturing here in the U.S. and then we'll just flip the script and we'll be exporting that to the world rather than importing it to the U.S. consumer. Um, you know, I have concerns about the availability of workforce. I mean, you saw what um, Joey presented. You know, this is a great goal, but we have to figure out how to either re-engage the workforce that is latent today that still exists, maybe that's additional skills training or um, we are gonna have to highly focus on what industries we want to bring here. We're gonna have to look at technology to make our lives easier, but to me that should not replace a job. I take very seriously the side of our mission that talks about job growth and job creation and good job creation. Um, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm really not concerned. We are interdependent. If you're talking specifically about China, it took 20 years to build that juggernaut in manufacturing. It will not change to Vietnam or Southeast Asia overnight. Um, there's, gonna, it, there's gonna be a need for a lot of investments in other countries. That can happen, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, it's a very good thing for our world to have the interdependency. It's never a good thing, perhaps, to put all your eggs in one basket. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Well, 
that was a very comprehensive and enlightening overview of what's happening with the port. And I will say it again, infrastructure, the port is a key strategic asset we have in South Carolina that you don't have in Nebraska. And uh, well, I'm glad we're in, in such good shape and poised for the future for more growth. Another important competitive advantage, of course, is energy. And that's what our next speaker is gonna be addressing, Felicia Howard. Felicia, uh, became Dominion Energy's Vice President for Economic Development Strategy in 2021. She's originally from Georgetown County, uh, but she came up here to Columbia and got her degree in electrical and computer engineering in 1985, that's impressive. Um, and then in 1991, came over to our school, the Moore School, and got a PMBA, professional MBA. So welcome to the Alumni Center here at USC. Uh, Felicia was promoted in this position as a role, uh, from her role as Vice President of Gas Operations for Dominion Energy. She joined SCANA, uh, subsidiary of SCANA, S-C-E-N-G, we all remember, in 1992 as a quality advisor in the utilities fossil and hydro generation business. She was the first black woman to hold an officer position in S-C-E-N-G. She's now based with Dominion out of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, she's responsible for Dominion's local, regional, state uh, economic development efforts across 16 states, so in a really good position to see where we are and how competitive we are across the Southeast. Um, and generally in a great position to uh, assess the economic outlook for our region. So here to talk about energy and economic development in the Southeast and in South Carolina is Felicia Howard. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. I don't know what I did to deserve to go after Barbara Melvin, but um, <laughs> I'm going to give it uh, my best shot. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. And um, as Doug was saying, I want to talk with you about this intersection between energy and economic development and share with you my thoughts about uh, how uh, what happens in the utility industry impacts economic development in South Carolina and beyond. So I, um, I thought I would start with the, um, well, firstly, let me tell you a little bit more about my, my current role. I'm uh, responsible for synergizing the company's economic development efforts across our company footprint. And you'll see in my slides that I think we're 15 states now instead of, I think you said 16 or 17, right? <laughs> and, and it changes, it fluctuates from time to time in terms of, of where we operate. But, um, that, that's my role. So I've been in economic development, had a, a responsibility in economic development 20 years ago, and things have changed quite a bit in that 20 year time frame. So I wanted to share some of that with you. So I'll start with telling you a little bit about um, Dominion Energy. Um, the Dominion Energy, we're headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. We're a Fortune 250 uh, company. Um, as indicated, we merged with um, SCANA Corporation, merged with Dominion Energy in 2019. And SCANA, as many of you may know, uh, was the parent company for South Carolina Electric and Gas Company, headquartered here in uh, Columbia. Um, and so we operate currently in 15 states, and we serve 7 million electric and natural gas customers. Um, and they are primarily in Virginia, Utah, Ohio, North Carolina, and here in South Carolina. And South Carolina has the distinction of being the only state in the Dominion Energy um, uh, uh, territories that serves customers both electricity and natural gas. So about two thirds of our natural gas customers are also electric customers in South Carolina. And so uh, of those 1.2 million um, customers in South Carolina, we have about 4,000 employees in South Carolina um, that, that uh, feed into the total of 17,000 employees across those states that we operate in. And our mission is to provide safe, reliable, affordable and increasingly clean energy. And I'll just share a couple of key points about each one of those elements. We're very proud of the safety record that we have. We focus a lot on safety. It's our number one core value. And uh, if you ever come to any kind of meeting, stick around, somebody works for Dominion Energy for any length of time, you're gonna hear something about safety. Um, our injury rate is roughly one third of our industry average. Um, and so in um, 2021, our customers in our electric service areas in Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina 
had uh, their power on 99.9% .9 of the time. And I know when that, when that power goes out, it doesn't matter that it's, it's that 0.01% still matters, right? And, um, but we have a high um, availability of our, our system. And as I look out at um, Iris Griffin, who's the Vice President of Generation for Dominion Energy in South Carolina, she's one of the women who's responsible for that. Um, and, and so our, our reliability has actually improved about 20% between 2012 and 2021. Um, also, I want to talk about affordability. Uh, keeping energy affordable matters just as much as keeping it reliable. So we pride ourselves also in being able to provide safe and reliable energy at a competitive rates. So we um, try very hard and look relentlessly for savings and things of that nature. And we have found the, that those efforts have paid off and our rates compare favorably to regional and to um, national averages, both on the electric side and on the natural gas side of the business. So the last um, bullet that you see there, you're gonna hear more about um, as I, I talk about um, this intersection between energy and economic development. We're also committed to net zero carbon and methane emissions um, by 2050. So if we go to the, to the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the utilities role in economic development. So communities, um, as I'm sure many of you here know, are in their best, most competitive economic development position when local, regional, and state economic development organizations are working together and are unified on a singular uh, goal. And I know that's somewhat difficult to do sometimes, uh, but utilities are uniquely positioned. We work with all of those entities, but we're uniquely positioned to ensure all of the community stakeholders are aligned and, can, and, and we can play a valuable role as a, a resource that engages with all of those stakeholders at all levels across the economic development ecosystem. So that's one important role. But another uh, role that I'd like to talk about is that, you know, recruiting businesses that bring jobs and capital investment to communities starts with and it ends with location, location, and location. Um, the decision on where a company locates is one it will have to live with for many years and, and potentially decades. Um, oftentimes they hire professionals in order to help them uh, make those decisions. They're evaluating all kinds of things related to the infrastructure, um, access to power, access to natural gas, to water, sewer, roads, ports, uh, rail, et cetera. You heard some of that from Barbara. Um, many utility services like electricity and natural gas, um, water and sewer are very important factors in that location decision. And so no matter what those other um, utility services are, I've yet to see an industrial or commercial business operate without electricity. So everybody's gonna need electricity. And so we play a very important part as, a, as an electric provider um, in the state of South Carolina and across the Southeast and, and where um, Dominion Energy operates, where um, we operate our electric, um, our electric business in North Carolina, South Carolina, and in um, Virginia. So I'll, um, I want to tell you also about, if you go back a slide, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, what we are seeing, I, I want to spend most of our time today talking about what we're seeing in terms of changes. I told you earlier that I've worked in economic development 20 years ago for South Carolina Electric and Gas Company, and um, a lot has changed since then. Uh, we're seeing some trends that make that uh, electric service provider all the more critical to the economic development decision-making process. And the first of those trends is increasingly aggressive lead times. So. You know, there are competitive challenges, um, all industries experience it, but the, the world gets a lot smaller. You know, Barbara talked about the imports and exports that we see, and, and people can get goods from all over the world. So we're not just competing locally, we're competing uh, globally. And so it's increasingly important, um, that time to market, the time that it takes a business to that's looking to site a new uh, facility or looking to expand a facility, their time to market is exceptionally critical. And so they are looking for partners that can help them manage that um, time to market. So um, one of the things that I think um, has happened, two things. Well, the first is that the pandemic inadvertently shortened the amount of time 
that it takes to do some of the due diligence for um, companies to decide where they want to locate. They can now, um, so if you remember early 2020, um, you know, in, in the past, companies would reach out to a local, a regional, or state economic development organization with a phone call. They may even go to a site visit um, and, and, and make several trips around the country looking at sites and what have you, even in their earliest preliminary phases. Um, with the pandemic, there were no site visits in 2020 or very few site visits in 2020. You'd have to be a lot further down the road uh, with your decision-making process um, if you decided to make an, an on-site visit. And so what we've seen is that uh, for the first two years of the pandemic, folks started to shift to do some of those evaluations online. And, in, and, and they're able to um, make decisions to rule your community in or to rule your community out without you even being aware of it. So you may never know that you were on a company's list and that they were looking at, um, at a location that, that you um, operate in. The second part, in addition to the kind of more efficient selection, site selection process, is that companies are looking for shorter and shorter construction lead times, and that includes the electric infrastructure. And so what happens today with electric infrastructure is we typically build to suit a particular customer. So if we don't have a customer, we're not just out there building utility lines and building uh, towers and other kind of infrastructure just for the fun of it. But what's happening is that the 24 to 36 months lead time that used to be perfectly acceptable, well, maybe not perfectly, but acceptable, um, we're seeing those lead times shrink to 12 to 18 months. And I can give you an, a, a very um, relevant and, and recent local example. Um, we had a, a, we received an RFI on August 4th, 2020. And um, the very next day, we had to turn around that, that request for information about how we could possibly serve a $400 million investment, a plant that, that was going to hire 200 to 300 folks. Um, they needed a significant amount of power. They would have been one of our, our largest electric customers in this area. And uh, they wanted to have that power. They wanted to be up and running. Um, they made it very clear from the very beginning. Within 10 months, they wanted half of the capacity that they needed. And then they wanted the rest of it in 12 to 18 months. As we started to negotiate with the company, they shrank that timeline to say, oh, by the way, we need all of it and we need it in nine months. And so um, the, with a lot of creativity and ingenuity and all kinds of stuff, um, we were able to serve that customer, get them up and running. Um, we were able to get all of the power that they needed. They were able to construct their facility, a 1.2 million or 1.3 million square foot facility in 346 days. Um, and you know them as the Mark Anthony Company, that, that um, Mark Anthony Brewing Company, that um, provides White Claw um, Hard Setzler, um, Mike's Hard Lemonade, Mike's Harder Lemonade, and uh, Cayman Jack co Cocktails. So um, that's just one example. The um, and really crunched um, lead time that, um, and they were able to, you know, from that RFI on August 4th, 2020, they were able to uh, produce their first sellable can um, in November of 2021. So an incredible, incredible um, time frame. The second thing that um, we're seeing more of is increased electric demand. And so companies need more electricity and natural gas than they once did. Um, many new technologies are much more energy intensive. Um, data centers, for instance, Barbara talked about Amazon. Um, data centers, for instance, can require power that is 10 to 50 times greater than the typical commercial office building. Uh, the Department of Energy um, says that all collectively the data centers across the country account for 2% of the energy usage in the United States. And so that's not a, a, you know, an unremarkable uh, amount of energy use. Um, by some estimates, electric vehicle manufacturing, battery manufacturing, as well as computer chip manufacturing can require power in excess of that needed to, to serve 200 to 400,000 homes. Um, 
Cryptocurrency is also a newly emerging technology. It has electric demands very similar to um, data centers. Um, indoor agriculture is another emerging technology that has a load profile very similar to data centers as well. Um, they are highly conditioned spaces and they require energy 24 hours, electricity 24 hours a day. Um, and so we're seeing increased demands for electricity. The third thing that we are seeing is more of an environmental focus. So um, even Barbara mentioned the fact that, you know, driven by increased awareness of environmental um, impacts, regulation, uh, customer um, interest and demands, investor demands, um, many, many companies are increasingly focused on environmental stewardship and sustainability, and, and they are making decisions about where they locate in this country based on some of that. And I'll, I'll give you another example. Lego, which I know everybody here has probably played with, stepped on Lego at some point in their lives. And, um, you know, they announced plans to build a 1.7 million square foot manufacturing facility in Chesterfield County in, in um, Greater Richmond, Virginia. Um, first U.S. manufacturing plant um, in, in their entire uh, company history. They're going to invest a billion dollars and hire 1,760 people. And um, when they were, when their top um, um, executive who was responsible for, for their citing their um, facility was interviewed, he cited three things as the reason for why they came to Chesterfield, Virginia. And one of those three things was sustainability. They wanted a location that would support their ambition to build a completely carbon neutral facility. So think about that, 1.7 million square foot facility that's completely carbon neutral. And they also want it to have access to renewable energy. And so the way they put it is, quote, the site and surrounding infrastructure sealed the deal. Um, he also talked about the fact that the site was shovel ready or almost shovel ready, which gets back to that compressed lead time um, issue. So all over the country, um, we've got utilities and economic development stakeholders at local, regional, and state levels working together to address those challenges. And so Dominion Energy's vision is to become the most sustainable energy company in America. And that includes both the environment and um, the economic well-being of the communities that we serve. So I want to tell you about some of the ways in which we're addressing those concerns. So if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that, that one of the things I mentioned with the Lego example is that the site was almost shovel ready. And so one of the important ways that we're able to address aggressive lead times is through um, making sure that we have sites that are, are ready to go. And by um, making sure that there's the available electric and natural gas infrastructure that companies need. So it's increasingly important that communities have sites that are ready and not like about to get ready. And um, so a recent study in Virginia, for example, um, indicated that 40% of the projects um, that they did not win was due to the lack of readily available sites. And so more than half of the states, including here in South Carolina, uh, where a program has existed for many years, um, many of the states have some form of a statewide site certification or some sort of site readiness program. Um, they may use different nomenclature from place to place, but the, the intent of them is to make sure that when they get opportunities to bring jobs and um, investment to their communities, that they're ready to do that. And so utilities and other community partners play a huge role in making sure that those sites are ready to go. And so one of the things that we do is that we are investing in infrastructure. And so in the electric and natural gas um, sector, companies are also um, putting in place or expanding efforts to maximize the efficiency and operational effectiveness of our existing infrastructure. So. Um, one of the things that is especially important to note is that our grid has changed over, um, since colonial times, <laughs> it's changed, it really has changed a lot. Um, so in 2021, um, Dominion Energy invested about $1.2 billion in electric transmission infrastructure in Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. We added 279 miles of transmission lines, um, we added 15 new substations. We completed 30, 340 substation-related projects. And 
Through 2035, the company sees the potential to invest as much as $15 billion to transform the electric grid. And part of, of what's driving that is that the modern electric grid needs to operate a lot differently than what it was designed to operate umpty ump years ago. Um, the clean energy transition is imposing new demands on the systems that transmit and distribute electricity. So our generation portfolio um, has grown to include a, a hundred renewable generation sites as of 2021 and is expected to grow even further to 400 by the end of this decade. And so we, we started with a system that was originally designed to accommodate a few centralized generation facilities, so a few nodes, and now it is a system that has to operate with hundreds of nodes. And so um, in addition, by early 2022, we had more than 30,000 net metering customers in Virginia and the Carolinas um, with an aggregate capacity of 184 megawatts. That's the size of a small um, generation plant uh, in the past. Um, that's a 54% and a 42% increase respectively. The, and so now we've got a system that was designed to be unidirectional um, that has to flow bidirectionally. And so um, the changes greatly increase the complexity of the grid and grid management, and they require corresponding upgrades um, to the grid to ensure that it continues to operate safely and reliably. Um, so like many other utilities, we're working with local, regional, and state legislators and regulating bodies to plan for these rapidly evolving scenarios as the grid becomes more and more complex. In South Carolina, for instance, we file an integrated resource plan every year, which tells the, uh, the commission that regulates um, the investor-owned utilities in the state what we plan to do in order, what our projections are in terms of customer demand, and then what we plan to do in order to satisfy that customer demand. And so um, we're seeing that our generation mix um, is changing considerably, that uh, renewal gener renewable generation will be more than 48 to 61 percent um, of our generation mix going forward. So if you turn to the next um, slide, um, just want to share with you a little bit about the, the more about the clean energy transition. Um, so I told you before that, you know, a lot of what companies are looking for is they're looking for a good environmental partner. And so we are heavily engaged in the clean energy uh, transition and Dominion Energy and other um, utilities, clean energy portfolio provides a competitive edge in attracting industry and jobs and capital investment to communities. And, and that in turn allows those communities to prosper, as you know. So we have more and more industrial customers that want clean energy to satisfy their own clean energy goals. Um, when they make their location decision, they, of course, do not have to come to South Carolina, right? They can go anywhere. And even our customers that already reside in the state, when they get ready to do an expansion, they can go anywhere they choose to. You know, the Boeings of the world, the Michelins of the world, Bridgestone, um, they are looking, they're setting their sights on every place that they, um, within their purview, that will satisfy their, their business needs. And it's not always um, South Carolina. So... Our increasingly clean energy portfolio is a big um, selling point. So our changing fuel mix, um, which is what you see on that, that represented on that, that slide to the right, in 2005, natural gas generation um, plants made up only 4% of our power, uh, the power that we generated. And coal made up nearly half of our energy um, generation portfolio. Over the past 16 years, those ratios have completely shifted. Uh, in 2021, coal as a fuel source made up only 12% of our electric generation, and natural gas rose to 40%. In addition, our renewable portfolio continues to grow. And so those shifts help us to um, deliver cleaner energy uh, while maintaining reliability um, that's essential to our customer. So, as part of our commitment to a sustainable energy future and a clean um, environment for our customers and communities we serve, the company is also studying the retirement of further uh, coal plants. Uh, and so stay tuned for that. Um, Dominion Energy's clean energy commitment also provides jobs and capital investment itself. So we foresee uh, up to seven, $73 billion 
in decarbonization investment opportunities through 2035. I told you that we have a net zero goal in 2050, and so this, some of that investment is, is to uh, advance our, our causes in that regard. Um, we've cut our carbon emissions by 46% uh, between 2005 and 2021. We've cut our methane emissions uh, by 38% between 2010 and 2021. And so Dominion Energy and other utility and industry investments um, in clean energy will significantly advance the clean energy economy and clean energy um, industries. So industries like solar manufacturing, like battery manufacturing, uh, like energy storage and, and companies that produce underground cables for um, solar panels and, and what have you. So there is quite a lot going on in regard to um, clean energy. I'll just share really quickly with you some of the ways in which um, we are expanding our renewable energy portfolio. And again, um, companies like Lego and many others want to have access to renewable energy. They want to know that their energy partner um, is able to provide them with renewable energy. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, solar, nuclear, and energy storage are among um, some of the, the, the uh, uh, fastest growing uh, renewable energy sources on our system. So as of 2022, uh, Dominion Energy had 2.2 gigawatts of solar generating capacity um, in service across the United States. We have the second largest solar fleet in the United States. Um, we have one of the highest penetrations of solar energy in the Southeast. And so in August um, 2021, so, uh, Dominion Energy South Carolina filed our integrated resource plan and it included a preferred plan, like I mentioned to you earlier, um, to increase solar over the next five years. And nuclear, um, Dominion Energy's nuclear fleet uh, constitutes the largest source of carbon-free energy in our fleet, in our, in our entire generating portfolio. One of those nuclear plants um, is in South Carolina. It's a VC summer plant in Jenkinsville, um, South Carolina. Um, our nuclear power stations provide over 40% of our total electricity generation uh, across the Dominion Energy System. In South Carolina, the VC summer plant produces enough carbon-free energy to fuel 225,000 homes. The company is also exploring advanced nuclear technologies like small modular reactors um, as an additional resource to provide customers with reliable and, and affordable clean energy. And, and um, given their dispatchable um, capabilities, SMRs as they're called, um, they are a very good complement to renewable energy sources because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. And so you need to have um, complementary um, generation sources that can fill in those valleys uh, when, when those uh, renewable sources are not available. And so SMRs typically are partially constructed in a factory and delivered to a generation um, site, and uh, it reduces construction timelines. They're small in size. Their modular constructability uh, reduces the investment risk associated with more traditional ways of, of building nuclear facilities. Energy storage is also another um, piece of our clean energy transition. Our company currently operates the largest battery, if you want to call it, uh, a hydro storage facility in Bath County, Virginia. But then there's also a 576 megawatt um, storage facility, uh, hydro storage facility in Jenkinsville, South Carolina also, right next to the VC Summer nuclear plant. And so um, in late 2021 and, and early 2022, we completed construction of our first 16 megawatts of battery storage pilots in Virginia. And we're in the process of constructing um, and planning more, another 70 megawatts. And so um, through 2035, we see the potential to invest up to $4 billion in energy storage projects alone. If you go to the next slide, um, offshore wind is a, another part of our renewable energy um, generation mix. We've proposed the largest offshore wind farm uh, on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, 27 miles out on Virginia Beach. Um, it's the Dominion Energy's Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project. Um, when that project is, is fully commercialized, we'll have 176 turbines. Um, today, there are two that we have been piloting, and they do generate uh, electricity now. 
Um, but those 176 turbines um, will be capable of generating 2.6 gigawatts at peak output, and they can serve up to 660,000 homes. Um, we're working with the State uh, Corporation Commission uh, to iron out some details. If any of you have been following the news on, on offshore wind, um, if that project moves forward, that will be completed in 2026, and, and we'll expect to um, have uh, created 1,100 jobs and uh, over $200 million in economic um, output um, on an annual basis with that project alone. So lastly, uh, if you go to the, the next slide, um, some other um, clean energy initiatives that we have underway involve hydrogen and renewable natural gas. So not just uh, on the electric side, but also on the natural gas side, uh, we're looking at hydrogen. Um, it's an, an important uh, and exciting new frontier, potentially capable of producing vast amounts of energy with limited or no carbon emissions. So um, we're doing some pilots uh, across our service territory of how we can blend um, hydrogen into natural gas and, and making sure that, that it's able to, um, you know, that's compatible with appliance safety and with leakage and material compatibility and things of that nature. So we've um, had two pilots in North Carolina. You see there, it's a, that's a training facility in North Carolina. Um, and, um, and we're also conducting pilots in Utah as well. The um, Inflation Reduction Act provided $8.5 million to establish four regional hubs across the country. And we are also partnering with, um, with several regions in order to support, support those hubs, creation of those hubs. Um, and so with uh, renewable natural gas, we're basically partnering with a number of, um, of um, companies that uh, have methane available, and we're able to clean up that methane and blend it with our natural gas as well in order to, um, to make cleaner um, delivery of natural gas. So with that, I'll uh, just uh, thank you for the opportunity for coming. I hope I've been able to convey, you know, how energy and economic development uh, intersect and what an exciting time it is to work um, in, in this field. So I don't know if we've got time for questions or yeah, sure. okay. anyone has any? You'll see on my slide there is a, um, if you're interested in hearing more about our renewable energies and our, uh, we publish a sustainability report each year and that uh, will take you right there if you do that. Uh, so thank you. Okay, thanks Felicia. Uh, this concludes our annual economic outlook conference. Uh, I'd like to thank um, everybody who helped make this happen, uh, the Moore School staff, in particular at Marcom, Marjorie Duffy and Adam Brown, uh, Tina Poindexter, Director of Special Events, thank you, Mark Richter and his team in the Office of Advancement, and all the Darla Moore School of Business staff and those at the, the Steedy's Alumni Center that make this happen. And finally, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, happy holidays and have a healthy, prosperous 2023 and hope to see you next year.